started. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry, we're just waiting to, to get the streaming up, up and running and we won't be long before we start. Okay, good evening everybody. We'll make a start to tonight's council meeting. Welcome and thank you for attending this evening. To begin with, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land in which we meet here this evening, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and future, and to welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be with us here this evening. Uh, item one on the agenda is membership. Membership is as listed. Item two, and apologies, there are apologies from Councillor Williams. Item three, disclosures of conflicts of interest. Are there any disclosures, councillors? No? Item four, confirmation of the minutes of council meetings held on the 21st, 21st of May 2018 and the special council meeting held on the 31st of May 2018. That's moved by Councillor Greco and seconded by Councillor Rennie. All those in favour? Motion is carried. Item five is question and submissions time. So I'll, hit, I'll go to the questions we received online before the meeting. So the first questions are from Anne Laver. Would you like to read out your questions? Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. Um, it's Anne Laver from Northcote. Um, shall I read out the comments, Mayor, or should I read out the questions? Which would you like me to start? No. So just the questions. Your comments seem to be in response a submission to the, the budget item, is that correct? Yes, and the, and the strategic resource plan. Which is all in one um, item. Yeah, so if we, we'll go to the questions first. Okay, Thanks. all right, questions first. Okay, 
Um, regarding the 2018-19 budget, the budget makes provision for 2016 for Capital Works for Reservoir Leisure Centre. What amount has been allocated to the Northcote Leisure Centre and have any additional funds been set aside for repairs and maintenance for both centres, please? So, um, pending the adoption of the budget tonight, so what's currently been proposed by officers is how I respond. Um, what's adopted, you, you can find out and see what happens. But so, in addition to the 20, uh, 216000 listed against the Reservoir Leisure Centre, there are amounts for $70,740 for repairs at Reservoir, $280,000 for maintenance at uh, NARC, $162,000 for mechanical, electrical and minor building works at NARC, and $81,000 for mining build, building works at NARC in three separate line items. And additional works can happen throughout the year um, through the facilities man management budget if works come comes up. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank yep. you. Tom. Number question two, Preston Market. Both the council and the VPA are advocating for a new incorporated plan with strong planning controls in order to save both the Preston Market rather than pushing for a heritage overlay. Council officers believe that a heritage overlay would mean more red tape and restrictions for traders. To correct the statements recently made, the heritage overlay practice notes state um, that the painting and other internal and external elements can be nominated to the sites according to its significance and that these controls should be used sparingly. So I think that was um, a, a statement that was inflammatory and it wasn't correct that the painting could be a problem. Um, an interim heritage overlay can also be applied to prevent the possibility of demolition of the site before the overlay can be approved. So this would, be, it would have been a possibility. The VPA have advised that the new incorporated plan does not negate the old planning scheme, planning controls that can only apply to the new incorporated plan. This means that the three planned towers will go ahead as approved by VCAT. This is, that's my opinion. Um, the VPA have advised that they cannot force the owners to abide by any new planning controls. It can only encourage the owners who would have to pay for all the new planning controls and new designs. The VPA and the council believe that the owners need to see the value of the asset. Both the new incorporated plan and the heritage overlay cannot protect the use of the current market space, i.e. maintain it as a market. The owners of the market have refused to agree to provide for more affordable housing in their development in Richmond as requested by the state government and want to instead push for a bill to rent product. This was in the age on June 6. Given these factors above, how does the council propose that the owners, via the BPA if you like, can be persuaded to retain and indeed improve the market? Um. Just before I go to the response, I, I guess I just wanted to um, agree with you that, yes, the three um, buildings that were approved last year at VCAT will go ahead. They do have a planning permit for that. And what happens out of the VPA process won't change the fact that they've got planning permits. So, yes, you're correct in saying that. In regards to, I guess, the core of your question, how does the council propose that the owners can be persuaded, or the VPA, can be persuaded to retain and indeed improve the market? Um, you are correct, Preston Market is privately owned and there is a limit to what we can do as council or the VPA can do um, in terms of uh, through the planning system or using planning controls and planning tools. So for this reason, the review that's currently taking place that council is working with VPA on um, is designed to explore other options beyond planning controls for helping the market thrive into the future. So the scope of the review is not limited just to the new incorporated plan, but it will recommend a new incorporated plan as part of that process. So this work, um, as you know, is in proce process and you're, I believe you're a part of the community reference group for that. And so we're really looking forward to being able to consider all of the options and the recommendations when um, th that work is ready to be presented back to us. All right, thank yep. you. Thanks. And the comments, can I present them later? Um, will you, you stick around for the budget? So we will do them before we consider the budget. Yep, okay, thank you. The next question is from John Berryman, who isn't here, so I'll read out the question. Okay. Will you read out his question? 
Yep. My question, um, I'm here on behalf of John. My name is Harvey Watson. And the question is on behalf of the Save Strathallan Open Space Community Coalition. It is reported that the Valuer General Victoria has prepared a valuation report on behalf of the La Trobe University to enable the sale of land to the Darabin Council. Given the current zoning of the Strathallan Open Space, a public park recreation zone, and that to our knowledge there has been no move to change the zoning, is the Darabin Council satisfied that the valuation provided is a fair and reasonable price for the Strathallan open space? Thank you. Um, so we'll be debating this later as a notice of motion, but I might ask the CEO to make comment on this question because the councillors haven't been briefed on the valuation itself. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, as you know, the valuation provided by um, Latrobe is confidential, um, so I can only talk in sort of broad terms about it. What I can say is confirm that I too am unaware of any proposal to rezone the land, and um, so Council's view would be, and Council will determine this more clearly tonight, I think, but... Um, Certainly, valuations are affected by an underlying um, ability to develop or non-ability to develop, and Council's view is that the site should be used for open space. So on that basis, the, the valuation should reflect the um, Council's position with regard to the use of the land for open space rather than an assumption of it being able to be de developed. And that is our concern, because the, the valuation as it we understand has been provided, certainly does not reflect um, open space. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are no other questions that have been submitted before the meeting. Does anyone have any other questions? Peter Roberts, would you like to come forward? Uh, thank you, Mayor. My name's uh, Peter Roberts. Uh, I'm uh, also uh, the president of the um, Strathallan, uh, Save Strathallan Open Space. I won't go for the full name, it's a bit of a mouthful, <laughs> but also the uh, golf club. But I'd just like to uh, make a personal comment uh, that it's good to see uh, Councillor Tim Lawrence back in the chair. Uh, if I can uh, just move along. Uh, you may be aware that uh, in respect of the golf club that uh, La Trobe University indicated on Friday that they were proposing to negotiate with the golf club a five-year lease. If I can explain, that is really only a short-term solution to the issue and that uh, in the past the club has had 10 and then subsequently a 15-year lease. My question is simply, given the current situation, is Council still fully committed to retain on a permanent basis or a long-term basis the land as open space is currently utilised and zoned. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And um, it was good news that, we re that you received on Friday in terms of the extension of your lease. But I guess um, from Council's perspective, it is probably just buying time because we still believe it should be, um, it should be protected. Um, and it, it just means that I guess we've kind of kicked the, the, the ball down the road a little bit and we will still come up with the, the same challenges um, at the end of your next lease. So we're fully committed to ensuring that the land remains as public open space and we will continue to work with the state government through the member for Bandura, um, with La Trobe University and with uh, the golf club and your community group. So we're fully committed to continue this work. Thank you. I'll pass on your comments to a meeting that we have tomorrow night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Are there any other, are there any other questions? Sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, we'll wait till we get to that item. Is that okay? okay? Yes. Are there any other general questions before we move into the rest of the agenda? No. Great. Thank you, everybody, for those questions. Moving now to item six is petitions. Are there any petitions? No. no? Item seven, urgent business. Is there any other urgent business? Item 8 is consideration of reports, 8.1, adoption of the annual budget 2018-19.
Uh, just one moment. Do we hear from the submissions first? Or do we, yeah. So we'll hear from the submissions first before we move the motion. So I'll call on Anne Labor to come back. Sorry, if you could just um, hold your microphone up. <laughs> Thanks. I'm actually just making two comments, one about the strategic resource plan and one about the budget. Uh, so it's not a submission per se, they're just comments. Um, I just note in the strategic resource plan that the SRP is based on the audited financial results of 2016 instead of 2017. And um, I wonder why that has occurred. I can't ask a question, so I don't know the answer. Um, there appears to be no KPI set to measure upholding the service level objective in this SRP, so you've got um, no measure against it. And it is of concern that the SRP recommends considering borrowing for contributions to the local government defined super fund. Um, this is a concern. And the SRP and the 2018-19 budget makes no provision for the developer contributions, non-cash items for construction of roads, bridges, um, footpaths and drains. And also, the staff turnover at 9.3% is very high, and I, in, I believe it might indicate a low staff morale, in addition, with this is in addition to the recent restructure. Okay, that's my comments for the strategic resource plan. With respect to the budget, um, I thank you for setting aside an extra 250k to plant an additional 1,100 trees. It's, that's great news. However, it is of concern that um, the 327k being set aside for all repairs and maintenance seems very low, considering, you know, the, the, the revenue, um, 327 seems quite low for the whole of Darabin. And in comparison to the 3.9 million spent on consultants, I believe is excessive, and it's disappointing that internal staff skills cannot be utilised to carry out these many of these tasks. Um, in addition, Rutherman Park was purchased by the Council for an open space last year. Now the Council proposed to allocate part of this park for other community facilities. This proposal and the decision to divert 371k in the budget away from this park to Maya Park or Maya Park is and not reinstall the barbecues, in my opinion, lacks transparency and good governance. Time there. That's it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor and Councillors. You see, our proposal that uh, Prashad and myself <coughs> suggested a few days ago to develop a skills database and a services database to help the migrants who come here who are struggling to get employment because it's right, to give them a voluntary placement, match the skill set and, uh, and then that would enable them to get employed in Australia, in Melbourne. Now, employment is the way we get social, you create social inclusion and integration in a community. Social inclusion and integration. We talk about social inclusion and integration, and here was a proposal which would have facilitated that. You have your skills, but unfortunately, it's difficult for outsiders without having Australian exposure to break into the labour market. So I'm extremely disappointed that the council staff have not recommended that. It was, and the other thing that disturbs me, when I looked at the, the budget papers on page 17, 2.5, strategic objectives involving our diverse community, it says we are spending $9 million on diversity. And this... So I would like to know in the future, let us break them down. For ethnic diversity, how many dollars are we spending? Initiatives that will create harmony, social inclusion and integration. This is a very simple, it doesn't cost much. Plus, the council would benefit, it's voluntary. That would strengthen, that will be a benefit to the council, right, it will benefit the migrants, so they can get employed and become productive, inclusive so, uh, members of this community. So and I would, just to finish it up, I would want, at least hopefully in the next financial budget papers, a bit more details. Here I find under diversity, entire customer services salaries are included. Customer services do other services as well, not dealing with diversity. So I think we, I would love a breakdown, 
what amount of money is being earmarked to strengthen multicultural communities and to encouraging them to become socially inclusive and productive residents of this community. Thank you. Thank you for your submission. Uh, we'll now move to um, the report in front of us. So, Councillor Rennie? Councillor? Turn your microphone on there. Phone on, to start off with. Um, declare a conflict of interest in relation to Maya Park that was raised by a resident just yes. then. I'm not sure if it's going to be subject to amendments in the budget or part of the budget, but I'll just declare close association. My brother lives next door to Maya Park in a residential okay. house. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence, for raising that. Um, if we get to that, um, you can ex excuse yourself. Councillor Rennie. Um, yes, thank you. I would like to move um, that we pass the budget with the recommendation included, but um, with a change which would be the addition of 5J to read additional operational expenditure of $80,000 to increase funding of program delivery at the seven neighbourhood houses and the Darabin Information and Volunteer Resource Service, offset by reduction of $80,000 in the operating budget allocation for the neighbourhood house feasibility study project. That's seconded by Councillor McCarthy. Now, um, because of the um, conflict that was declared by Councillor Lawrence, can I suggest that we split um, this resolution, uh, sorry, this motion up to isolate 5I which refers to Mayor Park and deal with that separately? Yes, I'd be amenable to that. Great, okay. So, Councillor Rennie, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you. This is always a very important meeting each year because this is the meeting in which we actually look at how we're gonna allocate resources for the year going forward. And I'm very excited that we've um, got to this point and it's been a lot of hard work. And I would like to thank the staff at Council who have spent days and weeks um, working on the budget and looking at how we achieve the best outcome in terms of the delivery of our council plan. I'd also very much like to thank all of our community members who made submissions. I don't believe we've ever had quite as many submissions and I think this speaks volumes to the process <coughs> and to the way in which we've talked to our community about the budget and invited their feedback. Um, further to that, we had about 30 people come and actually present to us last week, and that was quite an extraordinary process where we got to hear from members of our community, and I think that many of the changes that are proposed tonight from the initial draft budget actually reflect the extent to which we've been able to listen to our community and respond to what they told us. In particular, um, we had many, many submissions in support of the Beavers Road Bridge, which was already in the budget. We had a huge number in support of the Urana Road Trail, and we've actually allocated some resources to meet their um, concerns. We had people submitting to us about drinking fountains, and I'm delighted that we've actually allocated an extra $150,000 to increase the number of drinking fountains in our municipality. I think that's important not only for people who exercise and people who want to drink water, but also because it assists in the delivery of our single-use plastic elimination. Um, I'm very pleased that we were able to respond particularly to the submission by the Brotherhood of St Lawrence for their programs, which have a particular focus on employment outcomes for people from refugee and asylum seeker backgrounds. And we've been able to allocate $50,000 in this budget um, if it's passed tonight, to assist in the work that they do. I think this is a budget that's been very well put together and will enable us to really make great progress towards achieving the outcomes in our um, council plan. That's what we're on about. I think this next year of our council term is going to be marked by really significant delivery of outcomes. And I'm looking forward 
to the drinking fountains, to the trees, to the bike paths, to the new bridges and much of the other infrastructure, as well as to the long-term planning that is going to shape what Darabin looks like, not just next year, but in decades to come. I commend the budget to everyone. Thank you, Councillor Rennie. Councillor McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Rennie, for providing um, a great oversight of the, uh, the process we've been through. I just wanted to um, pick up on what uh, a budget like this does, and particularly the inclusion of the additional item um, in the case of item J. Um, some of the investments that Council has responded to through the hearing of submissions process are about responding to things that weren't in the budget but should have been. Um, but and sometimes they weren't because we hadn't heard about them um, through any other process, and that's why we have the hearing of submissions process and, of course, the budget submissions process that Councillor Rennie referred to. Um, item J is really important, and I'm really pleased that it's uh, been included and we've been able to deliver a, a, a proposed cost-neutral response because our neighbourhood houses in particular do an extraordinary amount of work um, in partnership with council and other community groups. And we know that for every dollar we spend with neighbourhood houses, um, there's a, a return of around $6 back to the community. So we've been able to include some additional funding to support some of the more entrepreneurial projects that our neighbourhood houses are seeking to undertake over the next 12 months. And this is part of our bigger commitment um, to that community capacity building that uh, we believe is so essential to our partnership with the whole community. I'd just like to touch on a couple of other items as well. Uh, obviously, Councillor Rennie has included um, or re referred to the funding for the Brotherhood of St Lawrence project, which supports refugees and asylum seekers. Um, this is not the only amount of funding that goes towards our work with refugees and asylum seekers. In fact, the programs that our neighbourhood houses other organisations and diverse um, do on a daily basis is supported by council funding. And we believe and feel very strongly that it's actually through funding these organisations that we can deliver some extraordinary outcomes together. Um, I want to thank all the residents and submitters uh, and members of the community who took the time to engage in both the budget meetings and also the budget processes. Um, Sorry, we, are, time. we are we are at, at time and it's time to vote on the budget soon. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I didn't give you a warning. Councillor Newton. Thank you, Melissa. I just wanted to particularly highlight how pleased I am with some of the initiatives that will be added for the Trobe Board, and I really wanted to thank the residents that put in a submission and came and spoke to us at the hearing of submissions. I think I'm really, really pleased to see Reservoir Bundura, Kingsbury McLeod becoming more activated. And I think that was particularly notable with Donathan Dole, which I think had about five or six submissions come from our community and our community reference group as well. Um, I was also really pleased to see that we'll be having more drinking fountains, hopefully along Darabin Creek and Sea Barling Reserve. And I'm very, very proud to be supporting 5J um, because I think the work that Reservoir Neighbourhood House and Price Marylands does especially is incredible and a huge return on investment. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Amin. Uh, it was really great um, seeing so many people involved in the council budget process this year. Um, so the budget's been really been designed around delivering on our very ambitious um, council plan uh, and we're seeing a lot of activity happening um, in this budget. I feel like um, we're getting some good bang for buck. Um, what we see here is uh, some significant capital works. Uh, we've got uh, no borrowings and, in fact, uh, there's a surplus here which um, we hope to put aside for some of the really big infrastructure projects that we've got um, coming up that we're planning for, as you see at the moment, including the redevelopment of uh, the Northland Aquatic Centre, Reservoir Leisure Centre and, of course, the Women's Multisports Stadium. Uh, some of the highlights for me are the three new bridges, one in each ward across the whole uh, municipality, our $4.4 million dollars for footpaths. We're delivering over 100 services to residents and businesses. We're preparing a new community engagement strategy, reinvigorating the Darabin Arts Centre uh, and updating the structure plan for Central Preston and of course as mentioned um, planting thousands of trees across all of Darabin. Some of the things um, that have come through from the um, community that I was um, pleased to be able to successfully advocate for uh, one was uh, new funding for the uh, Darabin 
Darabin Fruit, Fruit Squad, which is a really important program um, for addressing food security, um, community connections, particularly for vulnerable residents, and providing uh, skills for people uh, as well, including people who might be out of work. Uh, we had quite a few requests for drinking fountains along Darabin Creek, so I'm very glad that we were able to make that happen. Uh, and also the cycling infrastructure across the whole municipality, but in this case with a particular emphasis on schools. Um, so we have uh, West Reservoir, our first octopus school with um, new paths leading there. Uh, and the Beavers Road Bridge linking um, Croxton School uh, across so that people, the kids can cycle to school and Darabin residents also at Brunswick East uh, Primary. So thanks very much for everyone who contributed. Thank you, Councillor Amin. Councillor Messina, sorry. Thank you. Um, this budget's br Hang on a during second. this. Sorry, we just time go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the time I had started. Okay. Um, this budget process, I'm glad to say, included the voice of the majority of people we don't often hear from. 157 submissions with 27 speakers, 53% were already in the budget and 21% were recommended. This was an ongoing response, responding to community needs and addressing significant population growth and financial challenges. This budget is not just about Jarrabin the next year, this budget is about Jarrabin and its future, its future generations. The community spoke and we listened. I'm pleased to say that the Preston Structural Plan, there's funds for the Preston Structural Plan, drinking fountains, and that there are some much needed works to be done in the Latrobe Ward, ward sorry, Donath, um, Donathan Dole Reserve, for example, and G. Robinson Reserve. I urge you all to go and have a look at that amazing reserve. It has a beautiful um, heritage building on it at the moment that needs to be preserved. Um, I look forward to implementing the 12 months and beyond and I want to thank the staff for their ongoing many, many months and hours to put this together and um, for our late nights and I want to thank the community um, for, being, for, for providing your um, voices. Oh, what was that? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Messina. Councillor Greco. May, may, um, I have an amendment to, to move. And I seek your indulgence in terms of um, how I can um, uh, move my amendment because I have nine different points mm -hmm. that I would like to have included in the budget. And so, um, yeah, I, I'm in your hands, uh, Mayor, in terms of how we can um, best um, debate and, and discuss the, the various uh, points that I want to include in the budget. Okay, so there, the local law provides for, in terms of amendments, um, that any one councillor cannot, without leave of the chairperson, move more than two amendments in succession. Um, so we can treat it as one amendment, we can treat it as two amendments. Councillor Lawrence is on his feet, sorry. Um, yes, Madam Mayor, just point of order. Um, my understanding from the exchange that went on between yourself and the mover that item 5AI was not going to be yes. considered that's now sitting there in front of us. Could I have Sorry, some no. So, um, on that? That's, so that when we're not considering, as a part of this debate, we are not considering 5I. It was italicised to indicate that okay. the... They, it's, it's gone now. <laughs> it's gone completely. Okay? Too subtle. <laughs> okay. So going back uh, to May, if I just can make a, a point of clarification. Yes. Um, I, I think you, you, you have the discretion to... Um, okay, so can't, I do... I, I can... Yeah, um, to allow isolate you... each item so that we can at least dedicate some uh, proper attention to, can, can to the I, points that I've tried to raise. Yeah, so I don't think that we should be moving nine separate amendments. Can I suggest that is there any way that you may group some of these together um, so that we can consider some of them together? Would you like to put forward a suggestion? May, I, I look, I, I really don't know how to um, um, divide these up, but again, I, I appeal to your discretion in terms of, um, we, we've done this in the past where we've um, voted or um, separately on each um, 
on items and and again I, I appeal to your discretion that we we approach it that way uh, otherwise I don't think we you know in two minutes that I have to uh, debate nine nine points it just makes it really difficult just and, and unreasonable So we've just reviewed the different amendment, individual amendments and are suggesting a proposed grouping for some of them. So we're proposing to group them so that there will be four amendments of the nine. Okay, you happy with that? Okay. <laughs> you got double. <laughs> so would you like to move an amendment? Yes, we will move an amendment. <laughs> Hang on, we, so which one are we, we moving first? Um, Can you read them out? The, yeah, the, I, I, the... I said these around earlier today and the officers also have a copy of them. Um, so I'll read out... The, the first batch, uh, so it would be, first point would be to increase the number of apprenticeship positions from six to ten and training positions from two to five. Second point is additional operating expenditure of $15,000 to increase work experience and mentoring programs for disadvantaged youth. Another point is uh, additional operating expenditure of $50,000 to undertake a skills matching and mentoring employment project. They're the first batch of three. That's the first group. So you move that as an amendment. Is there a seconder for that amendment? Councillor Lawrence. Yes, I'll second it. Amendment. Moved by council, uh, seconded by Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Greco. Uh, firstly, uh, firstly, thank you, Mayor, for um, helping me um, um, split these um, items up. In, in relation to these three, as you can see, they're all fairly interrelated. And, um, and what they deal with is, is basically how we can, um, as, a, as one of the largest, probably the largest employer in the city, and, uh, and given the, um, the, the makeup of the city in terms of um, we have certain pockets in our community where there's high unemployment, and particularly youth, in, um, youth unemployment, is where we can actually um, act as a as a model employer by increasing the number of apprenticeships that we that we um, sponsor in the organisation and also the number of traineeships that we have in the organisation. I think this is important that we do this uh, because we often talk about this and and I think we should be leading as an example uh, to other uh, employers in in the municipality. Uh, particularly also, uh, May, because we have over, I think, nearly up to 1,300 employees, so we have the capacity to do this, and then also I would argue that we could even have the capacity to do this within our budget constraints. Um, also, I'd like to pick up on the on the point that was raised by one of our um, um, submitters, um, the, the chair of the Darabin Ethnic Communities Council, uh, Nalia Surakumaran, in relation to a very impressive um, submission that we received um, in, at the submissions of hearing, hearing of submissions meeting, in regards to doing a skills matching uh, between the community and, and the council in, in a, as a way of um, providing mentoring programs for people that um, have very good professional skills and other trade skills and how we can utilise those in the council and, and, all, and in, order, in order to ensure that uh, we provide an opportunity for people out there who are finding it difficult to get a job and actually get Australian experience. And, uh, and we could do this, we could actually provide this. So it would be both a win for the council 
It will be a win, obviously, for the people that are involved in the program. And it's also a win for the community because um, the community will be receiving extra service from the council as a result of, of, of having more hands on deck and, uh, and using the professional skills within, within our community. Um, this has been done before. There's, there, it's not new. Council did this about 15 years ago. It's a very successful program where we hired, not hired, where we mentored engineers um, and people in the various professions, and they actually went off and got uh, employment in those professions after they did their six to eight week stint here uh, with the council. And, um, and also some of them, I believe, actually stayed on and were employed by the council and filled up some gaps uh, within the council. Um, it, it, it's basically a mentoring program. It's not a program that actually involves um, the, the payment of salaries. And again, it provides a great opportunity and it's also a great example that we can um, um, put out there for, for other employees to follow. Thank you, Councillor Greco. Councillor Lawrence, did you want to speak to the question? Um, yes, Madam Mayor. Um, just uh, like to... Um support uh, Councillor Greco in these additions to the budget. Um, obviously, uh, with point 11, with, given the size of the council and the um, budget <coughs> and being the largest employer in the city, um, we really need, need to be leading the, the pack in terms of apprenticeships positions. So that's a very modest increase there um, that's been proposed. Um, in relation to point 13, um, and um, I suppose I've probably got maybe more experience in this area than other people, just socially, and being representing Reservoir for so many years, is the biggest barrier people have, um, new migrants in this city, which we have thousands and thousands of new migrants in the city, is actually entering the workforce at a reasonable skill level they can enter the, enter the workforce in low-skilled jobs, service jobs, um, but often they find difficulty actually getting jobs <coughs> with their skill set, with their education set, um, because their experience or qualifications may come from overseas. So this pr uh, program that's been put in will change lives in this city um, in terms of giving people um, some experience, some Australian experience to put on their CVs and as has been pointed out, wouldn't actually cost the council. Uh, it did work very successfully when we were working more closely with international students, and we had a number who then went on to um, different sectors after getting, gaining experience here. So I would really um, urge councillors to reconsider point 13. Um, that did come through the submissions <coughs> because it would actually help uh, seconds. some of the most recent migrants in this city. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Are there any further speakers? Councillor McCarthy. Um, Mayor, I'm going to speak against this amendment, um, and for good reason. Um, all of these are noble proposals. Um, I work in this space. I've, I run an organisation in my non-council life that actually works in this area outside of Darabin. And uh, so I speak with, with some insights into what actually takes place in Darabin, not just within da Council's work, but also other organisations. Um, councillors have been advised that we are already at capacity in terms of being able to supervise the number of apprentices and trainees that we currently have up there. We are at, at a stage where we are um, leading the pack in this space. That is correct. I would love to add more numbers to those figures that we've got up there, as Councillor Greco has proposed. But we need to be realistic about the fact that you need supervision, you need a whole program to sit around each position to actually make sure those people succeed. Um, and I'm going to take the advice of our officers in terms of what it currently takes to do that well. Um, and I don't think... We, we're not an employment agency, we're a local council, but there are organisations in our community um, and organisations that council has contractual relationships with who we have made very serious and significant demands of to step up their game. We committed to a 10% youth employment and pathways dividend last year. We are looking to progress that and see that implemented um, as quickly as possible. It is a, a complicated process to undertake, um, but that is where the real gains in employment opportunities are going to be, is making sure that for every 
dollar that council spends in the community, that there is at least a 10% or a 10 cents in the dollar dividend for young people. Now, that's where we're going to get the outcomes and our energies are focused in that space rather than simply creating additional positions that aren't ongoing jobs. We want to create ongoing jobs for young people. There are also organisations that council is funding through its budget already, such as the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, working with refugees and, and asylum seekers on a very similar project. We're also funding Moon Rabbit Cafe and the Neighbourhood Houses, very innovative models, social enterprise models, putting young people in particular, but also other people who have been disconnected from work in the driving seat in terms of employment opportunities. But significantly, through this budget process, we've also looked at how we can Council put pressure on those organisations that should be doing more of this work, um, rather than Council stepping into their, into their fray. Councillor Messina. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have two questions. Um, one of my first questions is, do we already have a mentoring program at Darabin? Ms Bishop. Thank you. Through the Chair. Yes, we do. We're actually piloting one at the moment. Um, it's a $20,000 investment. It allows for 10 mentees and 10 mentors. We're just going through that process now of finalising that. Thank you. My next question is, a budget is about a monetary value and we're looking and debating item number 11. It has no monetary value yet attached to that expenditure. Do we have an estimation of that expenditure? Through you, Chair. Yep, for item number 11, um, per apprentice, it's approximately 25,000, so we're looking at a $100,000 investment. And for the trainees, it's also 25,000. So all up, that program's about 175,000. Okay. Plus some costs there as far as actually resourcing it and the program management. Thank you. So generally speaking, when we're looking at a budget, um, so are you now wanting to speak to the item? I am. Yes, okay, Sorry. thank you. I'm going to speak against this. Um, a budget is about money. It's about funding. What we're putting up there is a motion that we're looking, we're looking for 175,000 plus an additional 15,000 plus an additional 50,000. So we're looking for, and I haven't used my maths to add that up, so somebody quickly do that. So what we're looking for is a, ne a neutral um, cost benefit. So we need to take out that amount of money so what we need to do is determine now what amount of money we're taking out and we've had plenty and ample time to discuss this, so I'm not going to um, support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Messina. Are there any further speakers? No? If Okay, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? And against? That motion is lost. Looks like the amendment is lost. We'll move now to second amendment. Thank you, Mayor. Look, I'll move a, a, another two items, as has been indicated to me by the um, CEO. Um, th those two items, I'll read them out. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is additional capital expenditure of $230,000 for repairs, lighting and fencing of tennis courts at the Lakeview Tennis Club. That's the first one. And the other capital expenditure item is additional capital expenditure of $40,000 to undertake works of, uh, for illuminated speed signs and a raised pedestrian crossing at the Northern School of Autism. Can second that. Second Very happy to second that. Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Greco, would you like to speak to the amendment? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Yes, just very briefly, I'll, I'll first uh, focus on the um, on the tennis club. I think, again, um, councillors, uh, we received a fairly impressive submission, a very passionate submission, I must say, from the uh, from the tennis club. Um, they were people that we met at um, at the um, at the listing post that that we had for for the budget. I remember meeting um, the people from the tennis club there together with Councillor Newton. And, um, and they followed through with a submission about the tennis club and um, in terms of that it's one of those places that um, they feel that has been um, you know, slightly, slightly neglected uh, over the years and they're, they're a very active committee that's trying to um, you know, obviously keep the cup club going, but also they've found that there's been a huge demand in relation to, um, to the, um, 
in terms of membership for the club and given the increase in the population. Uh, particularly what this motion does, uh, what, what the items of capital expenditure do, as, it, as they pointed out in their submission, again, which was a very detailed submission. I haven't seen submissions of that nature um, that often in terms of the, they actually broke it down into costings and things. It's basically, it, it's looking at the external area of the, um, of the, of the, ten, of the tennis complex and looking at the tennis courts and the, and the general upkeep of the uh, and maintenance of, of and look of of the tennis um, of, of, the, of the tennis club, there are various sinkholes um, at the at the tennis um, on on the tennis courts, which make it awkward for for people to play. And also, it's it's generally a, it's got a very tired look, a very sort of a run down look, and um, and it's actually in need of um, some. Um, proper repairs and also uh, an uplift in relation to um, ensuring that, that tennis games can be and competition games can be uh, properly carried out there. Uh, I've been informed by the, the club committee members that sometimes um, it's awkward for them to actually run competitions there and that they have to play in other venues because um, their tennis courts are sometimes not up to scratch. Uh, then I would just like to um, also focus on the um, on the autism school. We we received again a submission from the autism school in relation to safety and in relation to uh, um, kids crossing the road. Um, recently, we we put a lollipop person there, but I don't think that is sufficient. I don't think the school thinks that that is sufficient. We're dealing. We're not dealing with ordinary kids. We're dealing with special kids, and 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 these special kids um, um, require a little bit more more attention. And particularly um, when they need to cross the road, and also we need to really slow down the traffic and the movement of cars in in the mornings and in the afternoons, um, going into the um, and parents taking their kids to the school. So the request has been made in order to um, improve the the safety of that area, and um, and so I'm seeking in the budget that we include forty thousand dollars to start that work. Thank you, Councillor Greco. Councillor Lawrence. Um, um, yeah, I'd like to speak in favour of this amendment. Um, um, obviously, we'll get to discussing the budget later, but I'm, I'm obviously mindful when we look at the strategic plan that we have $94 million allocated to recreational, two recreational projects in the extreme south of the city. And so um, I'm... I'm concerned in relation to the tennis courts because we're looking at some major demographic changes in Latrobe Ward in the coming years, especially in regards to uh, medium density, increased density of families with no private open space. Um, so it's important that we actually maintain our recreation facilities and don't let them completely disintegrate. When they do disintegrate, of course, we then get lower uh, participation rates and we go into a spiral of neglect. Uh, and I believe that's what we're looking at if we do not address the Lakeview Tennis Court. We're engaging in a spiral of neglect. In, in relation to the autism school, uh, it's just astounding. That strip of street is a speeding area. There is only two ways from the roundabout out north of the city and they're both through narrow roads. This one's slightly wider, so the bulk of the traffic's speeding through there. So right where we actually want to have the safest uh, children's pedestrian crossing, we actually have the most dangerous in reservoir, the most dangerous. And I, I'm, I'm astounded we can't find some money for a raised path there. I'm just astounded. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Any further speakers? <coughs> Councillor Rennie. Oh, Councillor no. Messina. My question through you, Madam Mayor, is um, just in relation to the School of Autism, could we have some clarification of how much we're actually spending in relation to fixing up that particular area, please? Sorry, that's already allocated in this budget. So if we go to page 33 of the submissions. But officers, did you want to respond to that?
repeat the question? Yes. Could you repeat the question? I'm just... Sorry, through you, Madam Mayor. I'm just going through the budget at the moment and I'm having difficulty allocating the amount of funding that we have allocated to the School of Autism. So if somebody could perhaps highlight what page that's on, please, and what does it involve and time allocation for that, please. Through you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for the question. Um, Councillors, uh, with regard to the Northern School for Autism, you'll see on page 33 of the attachment... Um, with the, annual, the, sub, the submission summary, you'll see that, in fact, officers had intended um, that the, the effect of the resolution, the recommendation that um, Councillor Greco is putting forward with regard to the, the school actually be included in the budget. Unfortunately, um, that's been omitted from the recommendation. So at this point in terms of the budget, with the exception of the works that can be done within um, the operational team, so things like the line marking, for example, um, that, that they are included, they are able to be absorbed into the budget, but it certainly was our intent that um, we recommend to Council that the works for the speed sign design and the pedestrian crossings be incorporated into this budget, and it's, only, it's, an, it's actually an omission. So that's not included in the budget right now. Um, could I have a procedural motion that we separate the voting on these two items? Uh, yes, we can consider these separately. Um... So we need to finish debating it first. Are there any further speakers to the motion? Um, Councillor Rennie? Yes, thank you. Um, and I thank Councillor Messina for her question because that clarified for me something that wasn't clear because I was under the understanding that we had put some money in the budget for the Northern School of Autism. So I also thank Councillor Greco um, for bringing this to our attention. Um, I will be supporting um, the amendment to put $40,000 in for the Northern School of Autism um, traffic management works out the front of that school. Um, but I will be um, voting against the amendment to increase the capital expenditure for repairs, lighting and fencing at the tennis courts. And I don't say that lightly, and obviously as councillors, we would very much, I'm sure every one of us, would like to fund every single facility that we have so that it was a plus grade and, and met elite standards. Unfortunately, we don't have the budget to do that. And we did go through a very rigorous process in terms of determining which projects to fund in this coming year and which projects could wait a bit longer. Um, that process um, we called the Moscow process, which was to look at things in terms of must, could, should or would. Um, and we actually managed to arrange the budget in such a way as to fund everything that was in the must category, everything that was in the should category, a great deal of things that were in the could category, and we were not able to fund those things that were in the would category, would being what we would fund if we won Tats Lotto and doubled our rate base all of a sudden. Um, that's not likely, you know, the, the joke may not <laughs> pass you by in terms of me being the person who advocates against um, gambling harm. <laughs> so, um, you know, I know that there are many sporting clubs that have facilities that they would like to be upgraded. I would dearly love to fund them all. The reality is that we can't, and um, as much as it would be terrific to be able to m meet the need of every club in that way, um, next year we'll go through the same process. Thank you, Councillor Rennie. Councillor Messina. Uh, thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. I just want to echo the words of um, Councillor Rennie, and I understood that the $40,000 was in the budget, and I'm happy to support item 19, but not support item 14. Thank you. Councillor Newton. Thank you, Melissa. If I'd like to follow on from what Councillor Rennie and Councillor Messina said. So I agree that we've been through this really rigorous process. I've visited a lot of sporting clubs in the last few months and I wish that we could upgrade KP Hardeman Reserve. I wish we could upgrade, upgrade the Camry Cricket Club. But unfortunately, we do have a, 
a priority system and I'm really, really, really proud that we are moving towards a very merit-based system looking at the clubs with the most need first. So I can't support the first point about the Lakeview Tennis Club. Um, it wasn't recommended by the officers and there's just purely clubs with greater need. Um, whereas I did find the Northern School for Autism, Autism hearing of submissions very compelling. Um, they've now got a... Um, a traffic crossing person, which has really helped them, and I think this will help them further. Um, and I really thank Councillor Messina for um, picking up what happened. Thank you. Are there any... Council Lawrence? Uh, yeah, I've just got a question on this item. Yes. What's your question? Um, just uh, through you, Madam Mayor... Sorry. Through you, Madam Mayor, to the CEO. Um, firstly, I'd just like to know how this was omitted in terms of the budget. And number two, with the $40,000, are we going to see a raised crossing there? What is actually going to be done with the $40,000? <coughs> Ms Wilkinson? Through you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for the question. Um, so uh, with regard to how it was omitted, um, as you know, Councillor, the, um, the last briefing we had on this item was as recently as last Tuesday, um, and so effectively the officers had 36 hours to put the budget together um, before it needed to be released to the public. So unfortunately and regrettably, um, the, the intent hasn't translated. Um, I do apologise for that, and I'm very grateful to Councillor Greco for assisting us with that. Um, in terms of what would be delivered, uh, as councillors know, traffic design, particularly in areas as you've described, which are particularly busy and um, complicated in terms of their use, so their traffic, uh, they're, they're quite hazardous from a traffic perspective, um, require detailed design. So the intent of the $40,000 would be for the design, uh, for the raised pedestrian crossing and for the speed signs. Um, if it's possible, um, in this 12 months, we'll start the implementation. But um, it's possible these intersections, these roadworks can sometimes take some time for permissions. So um, the worst case scenario is design for implementation in the following financial year. The best case scenario is design and delivery. Councillor Lawrence. Madam Mayor, I'm just, again, a supplementary question on this because I don't quite understand. Um, my understanding of these flashing signs are standard and my understanding with raised crossings I drive over a few of them through reservoir um, they're just standard it's I mean they're not much bigger than two sizes of this table um, can't we get some works done what what money do we need to put in to actually get anything to happen through you madam mayor thank you for the question councillor um, yeah, I think one of the things that councils do is that they sometimes make these incredibly complicated things look quite straightforward and simple. And um, uh, so you're right, there are many examples of raised pedestrian crossings, but um, there are permissions from service authorities that are required. And with regard to the 40k speed sign, that's something that involves Vic Roads and... Um, uh, I'm doing the best to make our organisation efficient. I can't really speak for Vic Road. So uh, just to go to the point, our intent is to support the outcome here. Um, so officers are very much on the same page as you, Councillor. Uh, we want to do what we can to make the, the crossings for the kids safer. So we'll go as fast as we can. In terms of extra money, that won't assist in the delivery. Um, it is, I'm just trying to be realistic and open and honest about time frame for design. Thank you. Are there any further speakers to this amendment? No? So I'll put it to the vote. So we... Yes? Yep. So we'll um, vote on these separately. So um, I'll put item 14 to the vote. All those in favour? And against? Motion is lost. And so item 19, all those in favour? The motion is carried. Councillor Greco. Thank you, May. Uh, I'll move on to some additional um, inclusions in the budget. And, um, and again, uh, there's two further additions. I'll read them out. Uh, additional operational expenditure of $30,000 to increase funding for interfaith activities. An additional operational expenditure of $5,000 to increase funding for Friends of Bacow as part of Council's friendship commitment with Bacow. 
Is there a seconder? Yeah, I'll second that, Madam Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Greco. Uh, just very quickly, just in relation to the interfaith, um, again, we, we received a, a, a submission um, and also a presentation from one of the interfaith um, committee members and uh, pointing out to us, uh, I think this, uh, the submission that, that we received, I think what was really behind it was about um, how we need to increase the work that we do in this space. Um, at the moment, we do, we do some work, and actually the work that we have been doing uh, with very, very um, uh, few resources has received a lot of recognition. Um, I understand that we also won an, a, a state award in relation to some of the activities that we've been doing in the interfaith space. And I also know, being very active in this space, is that a lot of the religious leaders and, the, um, and generally the leaders in the community uh, look towards council as a, as a leading example in regards to um, interfaith dialogue and interfaith harmony. But as we've seen in the last few years, um, there's an increased demand for this type of activity. It's not something that you do and then you just sort of sit on it and, and you think that everything's okay. Um, we've seen in the last few years, I've seen in council, where we've seen a lot more discrimination, a lot more harassment, particularly of young women, um, and women of... Um, um, uh, particular religions that, that do get harassed in, in our city. So we need to actually uh, increase the, the work and activity that we do in order, to make, in order to ensure that everybody that lives in our city can live in our city uh, on an equal footing. There, there are a lot of young women that actually um, um, are literally afraid sometimes, even during the day, to actually walk in our streets. I find that quite alarming, that uh, I grew up in Darabin and, um, and I've never really had the, the sense of fear of walking in the street and, and I can really empathise with, um, you know, with that situation in, in, terms of, um, um, in terms of my understanding and of listening um, to people from different religious backgrounds in relation to what it means. So I think we need to boost our work and, um, and I'm... Uh, proposing that we, we put a little bit more money in order to up our work in relation to this um, interfaith space. In regards to the um, Friends of Bacau, as councillors may know, the, the Darabin City Council um, has, a, has an agreement um, which has been supported th through the state government with the City of Bacau. Uh, the, city, the agreement between Darabin and the City of Bacau goes back a long way. It's a very special relationship that the City of Darabin has with the biggest, biggest city in, 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 um, in East Timor. And, uh, and what the Friends of Bacau, which is a locally based organisation that acts as a, as a bridge between the council and the, and the City of Bacau, is, is talking about how council can better meet its obligations under the agreement so that we can do more programs, more projects uh, in relation to the, uh, the city of Bacau. At the moment, from what I know, we, we don't do anything in relation to the um, assisting and supporting the Friends of Bacau. So putting uh, just a very small amount of $5,000 uh, will enable us to uh, do some projects and some programs in order to meet our, um, uh, our agreement obligations. Thank you, Councillor Greco. Councillor Lawrence, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, yes, Madam Mayor. Um, just uh, briefly on point <coughs> 16, obviously um, with the whole um, struggle in East Timor, um, our community, the community of Darabin and the council have been involved for many years um, with East Timor and in relation to this uh, second largest city as well. So I think it is something that our community holds the relationship between ourselves and East Timor very dearly. And at this point, uh, to maintain that momentum, I think it, it's a good time for council to intervene. And it's worth remembering just the vast quantity of volunteers that came out of Darabin that went to East Timor um, on many elections, of course, but also with direct help. Um, and it was a, an incredible uh, amount of effort by the community. Now, the structure for that for us is our community representatives, friends of Bacau, and I think it's important that we actually uh, maintain that tradition of helping East Timor through them. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Are there any other speakers? Councillor McCarthy? Oh, Councillor Messina? Just a question through you, Madam Mayor. Do we currently... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's my strategic brain. Uh, do we currently fund any funding to the friends of Bacau at the moment? 
Yes, so there's a summary in this submission. I was just reading it. Um, I think it's, let me just find the page and page 31 of this one, or 176. Um, so they are currently receiving $2,000 per annum from council, along with in kind support through officer time and into government exchange. Thank you, you answered my question. Councillor McCarthy. Uh, look, I'm, once again, um, I, don't, um, I don't question the merits uh, of what's being put forward here. Um, these are both fine um, ideas. I would question the suggestion that, um, that increasing funding to the interfaith position, uh, which I think is what that's proposed, um, is going to, to be the best way to tackle the issue that Councillor Greco is referring to in terms of um, uh, women's sense of safety, particularly uh, at night time. Council is doing a lot of work um, at the very local level, at the community level, around infrastructure, around um, our Streets for People project in particular being a direct response to that. And I think that's a much more directed and effective investment um, when it comes to increasing, increasing perception and also experience of safety in public places. Um, we do have, and we are actually quite rare in, in having a, an interfaith officer in a council level. Um, I'm really proud of the work that our interfaith network does. Um, I know there was a submission proposed for that, um, but we, we have gone through a process here, and the, the advice is that the investment that we make at the moment is actually delivering some really great goals and really great outcomes. Um, I'm happy to look at this again in the future, next year, but at this stage, I don't think the case has been made to make to increase the investment in the way that it's been proposed. In relation to the Bacow situation, we've been through this before, and councillors have discussed how best to actually support our work with Friends of Bacow. Um, it's not just about putting dollars on the table. We do have a community grants program. Um, I don't know if there's been an application through that. Um, that's always available to Friends of Bacow. We did make a decision in partnership with the Friends of Bacow several years ago um, for them to become an independent entity and um, we all supported that, those councillors who were in the, the council at the time, um, on the basis that this would be about them becoming more independent and therefore um, our ongoing involvement would be in that in-kind space rather than pure cash contributions. So I can't support it on the basis that it seems like it's, um, uh, the case hasn't been made in terms of those sorts of investments. Thank you, Councillor McCarthy. Are there any councillor me? As part of the um, budget consultation process, I uh, spoke with one of the members of the interfaith um, advisory, um, community advisory group, and I know that it's a group that is really passionate, really high performing, and does a lot of really great work. I also know that they've got some really interesting ideas um, for improving interfaith connections across the city of Darabin around improving um, understanding of different faiths and um, sharing learnings between um, different religions and different places of worship around how they can um, improve inclusion, not just for their own communities, but across communities too. And I think that um, understanding and respect of faith um, is something that is, I was going to say, increasingly important at this time when we're seeing things like Islamophobia um, in our community. Um, I really hope that we can see some of these ideas put um, into action. I'm not sure um, that this is uh, quite the right way to do it, but perhaps through the um, community grants program. And I also wanted to flag um, that council does a lot of really good work with supporting um, interfaith and multicultural initiatives through the work we do in the Intercultural Centre, the work we do um, through the arts, uh, and ways that might not necessarily um, be labelled uh, as interfaith, but uh, have that those same goals of increasing understanding, community connection and inclusion um, for everyone, regardless of their faith. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? No, if not, I'll put, that, put the amendment to the vote. All those in favour and against? The amendment is lost. Councillor Greco. Um. Thank you, Mayor. And, and finally, I have two other uh, additions to the budget that I'd like to propose. And, um, and they are, the first one is to freeze all non-statutory concession fees for Centrelink concession card holder residents. And the second one is the additional operating expenditure of $255,000 to increase the pensioner rate rebate by $25 from $150 to $175. Is there a seconder? That's seconded by Councillor Lawrence.
Councillor Greco. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just in relation to um, to the um, firstly in relation to the um, the, the, the the pension um, the freezing of the um, of the concession rates for for pensioners. Um, the council has a program where it office, obviously offers uh, uh, discounted rates for, for pensioners. Um, as we know, um, and from a lot of the submissions that we did receive, um, a lot of the submissions were in relation to how we can make our city fairer for all the people that live in our city. As we know, the, the demographics of the city are changing, and um, but we have to ensure that we don't leave and uh, the financially most uh, the vulnerable behind in regards to um, access to services and actually have a, a full participative life in our city. So the idea behind this is that um, it's a gesture on the part of council to freeze the um, concessional um, um, fees that we provide only to um, concessional card holders. And so to like that, we can ensure that um, our pensioners, our people on um, concession cards, uh, from Centrelink concession cards, can actually um, um, continue to, to use the services that we do and not um, have an additional burden placed on them as a result of the fees being increased, um, in most cases by CPI increases, but also I've noted that some of the fees have in, are increasing beyond the CPI. There are some fees that are increasing by 3 4%. Uh, percent. So like this, it will ensure that our, um, our um, concessional fees remain as they were uh, from this current financial year into the next financial year. In relation to the pensioner rebate, um, I think it's important that um, um, this council, not this council, but the previous council, the council before that, actually for the first time introduced the uh, pensioner rate rebate. The pensioner rate rebate at the moment is at $150, and, um, and it stayed stagnant at $150 for over four or five years, possibly up to six years. It's never been increased by any CPI increase, um, so we've just left it at $150. The state government also has a, a pensioner a rate rebate, and it's over $220, but the state government indexed their pension for CPI increases on an annual basis. We don't do that. So what I'm suggesting, uh, it's a very um, modest amount, $25 increase in the, in the rebate, uh, in order to um, catch up with the previous years of um, lack of CPI increase in regards to the, uh, to the rebate. I think it's important that we do this because one of the... The biggest cost to pensioners is, in terms of their um, utility bills or their bills, is, is the rate re is is the council rates over two thousand. Some of them um, pay nearly up to two thousand dollars in council rates. So having a, a rate rebate of an extra twenty five dollars discount, I think could, could go to a long way to supporting. Thank you, that. Councillor Greco. Councillor Lawrence. Um, yes, um, Madam Mayor. Um, very happy to endorse uh, point 17 and point 18 here. Uh, in relation to a freeze on non-statutory concession fees uh, for Centrelink concession card holders. Um, if you could just hold your microphone up just to yep. touch more, thank you. Yeah, so um, I think um, at this council in recent years we've been gradually, um, I suppose, shifting to a point of fees where we're comparing ourselves to Banyol and Yarra and the fees and, and Port Phillip and catching up with fees. Um, unfortunately, we live in an hourglass society in Darabin and there's a great deal of people who have survived on less than $600 a week per household. And of course, what we've seen now is rents go through the roof. So in particular, um, in terms of the swimming pool, in terms of single parents, uh, we're seeing rents of 300 to 450 for average houses in reservoir. Um, so while our fees may seem not much, $10 for a casual swim, well, six bucks over at Banyol, that's where I go. Um, I can't afford it here. And I think we need to actually put a freeze on concessions because we've got people who are on Centrelink are renting and basically they're having to make choices about whether their children exercise or not. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Bessina. 
Thank you. Just want to highlight that this is a budget and um, there is no monetary value attached to item 17. Is that all you'd like to speak? Yeah, yeah okay. Councillor Rennie. Thank you, Mayor Lesurf. I think every one of us shares Councillor Greco's commitment to meeting the needs of Darabin's most vulnerable residents. But where we differ is in how to go about doing that. And this probably is um, really illustrative of that point. I don't believe that freezing um, fees at the current rate is actually going to assist those people who can't afford a swim. Because if you have no income, if you're a refugee or an asylum seeker, it doesn't actually matter whether the swim is $5 or $5.50, you are going to struggle and that's not going to be high on your agenda. And I think there are many ways in which this council can and should thinking about assisting those people. And I would say we should probably should think about programs that actually give people free swims and that that's where we should invest our effort. When we think about the most vulnerable residents in our community, I would suggest that by definition, those people who own a home and are paying rates are not the most vulnerable and are not the most hard up because we know increasingly that many people are locked out of home ownership and probably always will be. And those people who are lucky enough to own a home, I acknowledge that on a fixed low income, the rates are a very hefty bill and very difficult to pay. But we have a hardship policy that actually makes provisions for people to defer rate payments if they cannot make their rate payments. And I think that's the appropriate way to meet the needs of that population segment. Because I think if we were to suggest to someone who's renting at $400 a week in reservoir for their family that we should be um, increasing council expenditure by effectively um, giving rebates to people who own homes in the south of the municipality, that's really problematic. Um, combined with the fact that we have received um, recommendations against these because of the long-term budgetary impact, I don't think it would be suitable to proceed with this tonight. Thank you, Councillor Rennie. Are there any further speakers? I'll put the amendment to the vote. All those in favour and all those against? <coughs> That amendment is lost. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so we'll go back. So that is all, I think, of Councillor Greco's amendments. We'll go back to the substantive motion. Councillor Lawrence. <coughs> um, yes, Madam Mayor, I'd like to just move a small amendment to the budget. <coughs> what, and what is that? Um, I'll uh, read it out. Um, Given that you've got moving, um, sorry, I'll read out an amendment which would just be added to the end of after J on 5J, um, that council retains $271,000 in the budget for drainage works for Rutheran Park. So that's an additional point after J? Yeah. Is there a seconder? Can I ask a question before can, there is a seconder? Well, no, hang on. Before we get to that, we will check if there is a seconder. Oh, I'm a happy seconder to by second Councillor Greco. The purpose of the debate. Then. Okay, we'll hear from the mover and seconder first, and then you can ask your questions, Councillor Lawrence. Um, yes, Madam Mayor. Obviously, um, as I uh, pointed out earlier, I have a conflict with Meyer Park in that um, my direct relative owns land next to it, house next to it. Um, so it was unfortunate that I saw that um, item I5I, in response to community submissions, um, was actually removing um, money from Ruthven Reserve and moving it over to somewhere south. Now, um, so m the amendment I put here just refers to Ruthven, should be Ruthven Reserve rather than Ruthven Park, um, and simply seeks to affirm what was in the original budget prior to the submission process. And why I do that is that I do not believe that by disadvantaging one oval over another is appropriate when the people who are going to be, who saw it, their, their works were in the budget, have no opportunity to put a submission when their works are removed. 
Now, again, when we've got $14 million surplus and we've got, when we've got two massive projects of $94 million outlined for four years uh, in this council, so a massive $94 million on two projects, I think that we need to uh, respond to our community and not suddenly remove works with no advertising. May I reserve my right to speak? Okay, Councillor McCarthy had a question. Uh, thank you, um, Councillor Lawrence. May not be aware of the um, the context here, so I'll just ask through you um, if we can get some uh, additional information which may assist Councillor Lawrence in relation to this matter. Because my understanding is that it's actually. So hang been... on, ask your question. Yep, Don't answer sure. it. Sure. If we can get some context as thank to you. why the proposal has been to remove those that uh, those works or delay those works at Ruthven at this stage. Ms Wilkinson? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, thank you for the question. Um, so the, this recommendation has been discussed with the club at Ruthven Park and, um, in fact, they're quite happy for the works to be delayed. It works out for them in terms of their playing schedule. And um, so uh, the time frame for these works actually suits the club and it was at their request that this has been made. Any further speakers? Councillor McCarthy. Um, on that basis, I will, and I, that was my understanding, I'll speak against um, Councillor Lawrence's amendment, um, not because I, I don't want to see those works go ahead. I do want to see those works go ahead at, at Ruthven. Um, they have been considered, but when we have a club that's saying, let's not do this just now, we would like this to be delayed, I think we need to hear that, and, and that's the request. I think um, it would be... Uh, problematic for us to be putting funding in our budget, our annual budget, in, in this case 271000 um, to a project which the club itself is saying it does not wish to proceed with in this current financial coming year. Um, we need to listen to the, what the clubs are saying and um, that is the only reason why I would be prepared to say no to Councillor Lawrence's proposal. I think it has been put forward um, in, in all the right, with all the right thinking, which is that we should not disadvantage clubs against each other, and that's not what's happening here. There's an opportunity here to proceed with works that were going to happen anyway, um, and we're simply around moving those projects around. This project, the Ruthven project, I would expect, um, assuming that the club is supportive, would actually be happening in the next budget once they're ready. And and uh, that's, I'm, I'm seeing nodding heads, and that's my understanding, and I would expect that um, we would see that in the forthcoming budget for the following year, which is the 19 and 20 budget. Thank you. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Greco. Oh, I, I've just got a question. Um, I, I just wanted to get some more information uh, because I had not heard that uh, before. I, I may have missed it, just in regards to uh, the conversation between the club uh, and the council and when that actually took place. Ms Henderson? Um, through you, Madam Mayor, I can... Through you, Madam Mayor, I can confirm that the club has sent through to um, leisure service staff confirmation that they don't wish the drainage works to go ahead in the coming financial year. Fourth of June? It was fourth of June. Okay. So that's happened just over a week ago. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Greco. Yeah, Madam Mayor, just on that information, I thank the officers for providing that information. I wasn't aware of that. And, uh, and on the basis of that, if the club has actually uh, stated, and uh, I take it from the officers that they've uh, submitted, um, uh, given us given it to us in writing, that they don't mind the, the works being deferred or on the basis of that um, I will not be supporting this motion. Thank you. Is there any other speakers? No. Uh, Councillor Lawrence? Um, Sorry, that there's no right of reply to an amendment? Just a point of order, yeah. because now that I have that information... Yes. Um, you you may I'll, wish to withdraw your amendment. I wish to withdraw it, but I'd certainly be more... Um, I suppose would have referred it to next year's budget so it's not remembered, forgotten, but anyway. So you're requesting to withdraw your amendment and that it be considered for, and that you'd like it to be considered to the next year's budget? Um, yes, I'm withdrawing that, uh, that amendment, but, yeah, I'm just underscoring um, 
hopefully it's referred to next year because it, it seems to be I put up something yeah. twice, usually it goes in the budget after twice. Thank you. So we'll withdraw that amendment. So we'll go back to the substantive motion. Um, are there any further speakers to the budget, to the substantive motion? Can Councilor we speak Gregor? in relation to the budget? Yes. Yeah. You haven't spoken yet? Uh, look, I'll just take this opportunity to uh, speak in relation to the budget. I will be supporting the budget, notwithstanding that my um, uh, nine amendments were, have not been um, included. I, I'm a bit disappointed, uh, or eight of them. Um, I'm a bit disappointed uh, with councillors that um, none of the amendments have been included, notwithstanding, notwithstanding that, um, that a lot of the suggestions that I did put forward have come directly from submissions. It's one thing to say councillors that um, we've received a lot of submissions and we're happy to have received the submissions. It's another thing to actually act on those submissions. And I think that the process of listening is when you actually act on those submissions. The other point that I would make is that um, notwithstanding that I think there's a lot of positive things in the budget, I, I think we need to do more uh, for people who are doing it tough in our city. Um, our, our budget um, at the moment, the way it is, I think is skewed away from actually supporting uh, the vulnerable people in our city. And when I say vulnerable, I don't mean the most, only the most vulnerable, because often in the debate when we talk about vulnerable, we go right down to um, people, either asylum seekers or refugees, who really are really, really doing it tough. But I just say also the, the people who are doing it tough in our city are people on fixed income, pensioners, and also other people who are, who are having um, difficulty in, in, in fully participating as full citizens in the life of our city. I think we've skewed away from that in this budget. Um, I've been all year um, negotiating and, and debating with my colleagues about how we can keep out, we can do many things. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, and I think that we need to really get our priorities um, right and realign and realign to actually supporting the ones that have the most need in our community. So notwithstanding those comments, I will support the budget, uh, but I'll still keep battling and, and arguing and debating um, that, we, um, that we spend more of our money and more of our resources on, on supporting the, the vulnerable you. people in our community. Thank you, Councillor Greco. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Lawrence? Um, yes, Madam Mayor, I rise to speak against the budget. Um, so, Madam Mayor, again, um, I think I've been consistently voting against the four-year council plan. Um, maybe that's the burden of experience speaking. But um, fundamentally, the priorities in the uh, council plan for the four-year plan set up an unequal distribution of capital works that's going to be the hallmark of this council. And in particular, you know, I'm amused by the, the term at capacity, which is now trotted out, which is very Trump-like and a conservative um, sign of a conservative council or aggressive council. The capacity in this budget for four years has been distorted because we've created the expectation of $60 million being spent in NARC without that being costed yet without us actually cutting it to the community need. We actually have two pools. The second pool will never get any, any treatment in this next four years or the next six years because we've ballooned out the budget and the expectations on NARC to begin with. So again, we're framing everything uh, incorrectly. Uh, it is sort of laughable when we start debating about whether there's $40,000 for road, for essential road safety in this city, and we've blown out and distorted the recreational budget over the four year by $94 million. Um, the other great white elephant in our budget, in our council plan, of course, is the women's, what's now referred to as women's indoor stadium, which includes outdoor netball. First costed on $6 million worth of development levy, $3 million worth of uh, capital Works, which has disappeared, and we were hunting for $4 million to do a $13 million project and get three indoor courts there, as well as some outdoor. That's ballooned to $34 million. We're at time now, thank you. Uh, there is no way a state government will fund that kind of triple-type cost 
We can't present gold-plated infrastructure and be taken seriously. Those you, indoor Lawrence, courts are costed at three million per court. So the lack of reality Council Lawrence, at the heart order of this now, budget please, you're at time. is monumental failure, I'd say, in basic management. Now, that's why we're disappointing the community. Councillor Lawrence, that's why, you're out of time now, please. That's why there's a two-year wait for swims at Reservoir, and there will continue to be. Councillor Lawrence, can you please resume your seat? I, I'm standing, so I'm not resuming my seat. Um, Councillor Lawrence, yes, your time has now expired. Can you please resume your seat? Well, you Everyone is allocated a matter of time. don't like my, what I'm saying. You can make a ruling from the chair if you don't like okay, what you're speaking. I'm just consulting the local law. Okay, so I'll now call that as, as you are finalising your, your debate. Um, and we actually heard from everybody now. Because there was an amendment, there is no right of reply. Um, so I'll now put this motion to the vote that's on the screen. All those in favour and against, the motion is carried. Madam Mayor, can I have recorded my opposition to this budget? Yes, Councillor Lawrence um, will have his vote recorded in opposition to the vote. Now we'll move now to item 5I. Councillor Lawrence. Do you wish to I, I, I wish to vacate the chamber. We're going to debate Meyer Park. Thank you. On the basis of close association. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So we need someone now to move this as a motion. That's moved by Councillor Rennie and seconded by Councillor McCarthy. Councillor Rennie. Um, very briefly, there's already been some discussion of this item. Um, we've had a budget submission about Mayor Park. We did and were aware that there were issues with the drainage. Um, we have heard that at WR Rutherford Reserve, the club um, would actually prefer us to defer works there. We're talking about two fields that both have drainage and surface um, issues, and so we're simply going to do these in a, a different order to what might have otherwise occurred. On that basis, I think it can be supported. Thank you. Councillor McCarthy? Uh, thank you. I'd like to, um, to thank the submitter, um, Mr Andrew Skoulos, for bringing to our attention um, some of the issues that have been experienced at Mayor Park um, and getting this into Council's um, budget parameters. We know that uh, there is a, a significant growth um, in obviously um, uh, activity both in women's sport but also in, in the junior areas and the opportunities that uh, Mr Skoulos outlined but also the risks of not acting in relation to this ground um, are significant. Um, so we would be remiss not to take the action that's proposed tonight and the investment um, will ensure that we have a safer ground for young people and, uh, and they're not so young to, um, to play sport um, at Mayor Park. And I look forward to seeing the other project um, at Ruthven Park um, funded in the subsequent year's budget as is requested by the club there as well. So I thank um, Mr Skoulos again and all the club members uh, for putting this on our agenda and uh, look forward to those works happening. Thank you. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Amin. Uh, the issue of safety at Mayor Park is one that's come up a few um, council budgets in a row um, with the surface um, being uneven, being muddy, causing um, trips and falls and sprained ankles. Um, so I'm glad that we're able to do these works. Mayor Park um, is uh, near the border of Rucker and Kazali Ward and is in an area uh, in West Thornbury, which is quite a high growth area. It's not too far away maybe a kilometre or so from uh, Preston Junction um, and the Oakover Precinct, both of which we're going to see high um, increasing density. We've already seen quite a lot of growth in the area and a lot more to come. Um, so it's good to see this happening now. We, um, When we got elected, made a promise to the community around improving infrastructure and planning, not just for the people who live in Darabin now, but also the people who will live in Darabin in the future. And I feel like um, this is part of that by increasing... Um, investment in the areas where we're going to be seeing higher growth in the coming years. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? No, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? 
That motion is carried. If we could get someone collect Councillor Lawrence. Moving now to item 8.2, Women's Multi Sports Stadium. That's moved by Councillor McCarthy, seconded by Councillor Rennie. Councillor McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, what we have here is a recommendation to, to move to the next stage with Women's Multi Sports Stadium, a project which, as councillors would be aware, has gone through a number of iterations over recent years, um, particularly in terms of narrowing down from an initial concept. Um, to what we actually need, not just now, but also in the future. We know with the population growth that we will see in the city of Darabin, based on state government targets, that we will have a significant increase um, in our own population, but also demands on our infrastructure and our sporting and recreation infrastructure. One of the great legacies that we inherit here in the city of Darabin is that there has been significant infrastructure investment in um, sports uh, grounds and sports facilities that, uh, that provide predominantly for men, but that hasn't been the case for women. And so we have many stories, and they're well documented and well publicised in the papers about the sheer number of girls and women who have been forced to travel uh, well and truly outside of our municipality, often um, not only crossing the river but heading uh, 25, 30 kilometres um, to our east or to our west or to our south, um, to, to other corridors, to other sites, just to get a game. And this project is one significant way of us addressing that social and gender inequity that has existed for a long time. This is by no means a small project. The current cost estimate, as, uh, as councillors would see, is uh, in the order of 33 million and uh, that is what it takes in order, in the current numbers, to deliver the sort of outcome that we need um, at uh, John Kane Park with Women's Multi Sports Stadium. This project has been, as I said before, um, developed over a number of years. It has a significant amount of community support um, and, in fact, came about off the back of a, a petition of a 1,000 residents, um, club members and uh, girls and, uh, and parents across Darabin um, saying that we are not only disadvantaging women and girls, but we're also creating a problem where um, Darabin Sports Stadium in Reservoir um, is dominated often by clubs from the south. So it actually frees up places in the northern part of Darabin um, to make sure that we can have more teams across the city playing in our facilities. Um, what we have here is, is really the next stage to move forward and to allow us to go to the stage of actually appointing an architect and designer to actually develop this proposal to the next stage. We'll continue advocating to the state government for them to invest in this project. We think it's a terrific way for them to be involved in increasing sporting and recreation facilities, particularly for women and girls. We know that we have a big work, a big job ahead of us um, to increase those numbers, the current numbers of women's participation being around 10 to 12 per cent um, in the city of Darabin. To get to that position of around 40 per cent over coming years is going to take a huge effort, not just in terms of programming, but also in terms of infrastructure. So I just wanted Ten to seconds. commend this. Um, proposal, commend the next stage, thank everyone that's put work into it and looking forward to uh, seeing this open in years to come. Thank you. Councillor Rennie. Thank you. As with Councillor McCarthy, I'm delighted to be able to support um, this. I think it's very timely for us to move forward and move forward quickly. It's been a project that's been many years in its um, development and um, earlier Councillor Lawrence talked about differing costs. I think if we talk about those costs, we're simply not comparing apples with apples. Um, initial costings were done looking at different sites, looking at different models. I'm confident that the costs that we now have in front of us are representative of what we can expect. But I really think that the most compelling argument about why we need to proceed and proceed as quickly as we can is in the report on page um, 183, where it says the participation rates in netball in Darabin are currently 0.7%, which is significantly less than both the national and state participation rates of 2.1% and 2.3%, re respectively. That means that less than one third as many women and girls are playing netball in Darabin as in Victoria. And I don't see how we can address women's participation in sport without addressing that. 
that if only a third, you know, there's no reason to believe that women and girls want to play netball less in Darabin than they do elsewhere. The problem is they're simply not afforded the opportunity that they have to go very long distances sometimes for games. That makes it impossible for families to organise transport because they're potentially transporting different kids in different directions. And I think that this is an equity issue and it is a facility that will be used by residents all over Darabin. Access to the multi-sport stadium from different parts of Darabin is quite good down Albert Street. And I really look forward to seeing this happen. I think it's fantastic that the outdoor courts are actually not very far away. Ten seconds. And um, it will be an asset to the whole of Darabin. Councillor Lawrence. Um, yes, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd like to propose a fifth point for the... Sorry. A fifth point for yes. the motion. What is it? Um, just a point five that uh, council requested officers develop a more competitive costing for this project and present it to the next council meeting. Is that accepted by the mover and seconder? No. Would you like to move it as an amendment to the motion? Um, yeah, I'll move that as an amendment to the motion. Is there a seconder? Uh, I'm happy to second that for the debate, mate. That's seconded by Councillor Gregory. Councillor Lawrence. Um, yes. Sorry, just before we get there, we might just get the word. Do you have the, it written down? Yes. If you yeah. could pass that on. Councillor Lawrence. Um, yes, Madam Mayor, I'll just speak to the uh, amendment. Um, currently, um, this project was missed 20 years ago when that could have possibly been built at Thornbury High School, and um, unfortunately that was missed by the council. Um, so there's a huge gap in infrastructure uh, for four courts. I'm concerned that we're actually putting in a bid that is non-competitive, and whether deliberately or not deliberately, is bound to fail. And it's to fail because I'm involved in um, these sports considerably. And uh, other cities are basing their, their, their um, costing on $3 million per court, indoor court, plus whatever you have to do extra. Obviously, there's extra roads and things. And obviously, we've seen the outdoor courts are very cheap to build. We've already had some built in Plenty Road. So my concern here is that we're actually competing not against Yarra's $60 million white elephant on the gas sites. We're competing against the outer suburbs that have properly costed projects that deliver um, the same results for, th for, for only 30% of the cost. And this, I think, is going to create an expectation in the community that this can be delivered. It can't be. We need to trim it somehow. Any extra landscaping work should be removed from this and put into the normal master plan. We need to be competitive on this. We were almost had the four million. We almost had the three courts done. I'm not sure why it went astray. But these extra numbers makes this non-competitive across the whole city of Melbourne because the state government has to consider things on a return to investment across the whole city. So that's why I put in the uh, point five um, and... I think it's something this council should be trying to do for the sake of our four years of budgets to actually have realistic projects that won't just crowd out the capital works and get nowhere and frustrate the community. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Look, after hearing um, Councillor Lawrence, um, I'm inclined to support this um, addition to the, um, to the to the motion, because I think um, if you read the motion, it's actually requesting that officers develop a more competitive um, um, costing, and that something comes back to the councillor. I, I think it's a worthwhile exercise in terms of um, rigour, financial rigour, um, and also I think it will be a worthwhile exercise, as councillor Rennie has said, in order to give this project the best possible chance in terms of attracting money from the, um, from the state government. As we know, um, you know, there, there's many councils that will be putting out their hands with the uh, with the state government in order to attract um, funding, uh, because a lot of these types of projects uh, cannot be fully um, um, resourced 
um, through through rates and through individual councils. So I think we need to put our best foot forward. We need to be very rigorous financially in terms of what our uh, request is, and that that it, that it meets all scrutiny uh, as far as possible with the both the state bureaucrats and obviously ultimately with the ministers that actually. Make, have the final say. So the more work we can do on this, the more scrutiny we can um, apply to our, our funding application, future funding application, I think the better for the council. Uh, it will make us much more informed of, of exactly what is required and that, like that in future as we move forward we can make more informed decisions. Thank you, Councillor Greco. Councillor Rennie? I'm going to speak against this amendment. It's been suggested that perhaps by doing more work and delaying this project it might become cheaper. And I can say with some conviction that the thing that makes projects take long, uh, cost more is that they take longer and costs only get greater with time. To suggest that there hasn't been rigour I think is actually quite offensive to the number of us who have sat through numerous briefings and had quite lengthy debates about what we want and how to keep the costs down. We have actually cut out a lot of bells and whistles out of the project. We've decided not to go with a kind of statewide elite facility that would have cost 10 million more. We've actually looked at what is the nature of the local facility that our community needs. And when you look at the costing, we can see that some of the cost, about three and a half million, is intersection and entry works that will be required to actually manage the site. So they're not about the building of the stadium. That um, the outdoor netball courts, are 3.3 million, that's already underway. We know that um, they're going to be delivered. And that access road, lighting and pedestrian paths are close to a million. So the actual stadium itself is about 25 and a half million. And I'm confident that ha that has been rigorously costed. It is true that it is not as cheap as it was once thought it might be. And a lot of that is because it's now going to be built at a first floor with a car park on ground floor. We don't have the benefit that some of the growth areas have of a lot of cheap land. We are now trying to build facilities for our community to make the most of the sites and the land that we have, knowing that um, providing car parking for these type of facilities is essential. So as I said, we have been in numerous briefings. Um, officers have spent huge amounts of time preparing an extremely rigorous brief for us. And um, I don't believe it should be delayed. Every delay is one girl or one woman who doesn't get to play netball or Thank more. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rennie. Are there any further speakers? Councillor McCarthy. Uh, it's actually a, a... Sorry, just a question. First of all, if, if we could just get officers to... Um, uh, ask officers to provide um, a little bit more information, because I understand Councillor Lawrence may not have... Um, uh, been available at the time, but we have had briefings on this that have been quite rigorous in relation to this piece, and it would be useful to um, to explain the issues with the land there and the costings associated with that. So the que I'll direct the question to Mr Albertini. Um, for you, Madam Mayor, um, Ms Chair. Um, yeah, there's a number of issues relating to the fact that we have soil contamination areas there to worry about. We also have to provide sufficient car parking for the area because you need the car parking for the courts. Um, as Councillor Rennie mentioned, there's also a fair bit of work with respect to the traffic intersection works, plus the, you know, the outdoor courts that we're providing. We have to provide other access uh, paths around the area because the new courts actually interfere with that. So, yeah, there's multiple issues to deal with and, um, yeah, there's been got a significant amount of due diligence to actually come up with the cost estimates. Thank you. Councillor McCarthy? Uh, thank you, and thank you um, to our officer for that uh, additional information. I think we need to recognise that, uh, as Councillor Rennie pointed out, when we're trying to do projects of this size and scale in an area where land is limited and sites are constra constrained, that uh, we need to actually be realistic about the cost of doing those things. But we also need to recognise that what we're grappling with here is actually significant underinvestment over previous generations. Um, we are trying to catch up and as quickly as we can. And as Councillor Rennie pointed out earlier, the, uh, the participation numbers in Darabin are actually woeful um, compared to the state average. They shouldn't be that way. And the lack of infrastructure, the lack of courts, particularly um, nighttime courts to, avail, to enable people to play during winter and in the evening in a safe way, is being severely lacking. Um, I, I'd think if we put those issues right in front of us and we talk about 
the level of investment that's required to get an outcome. This is actually very realistic. It's very appropriate. It's aligned with our strategies. It's something we've been planning for for eight years and we've had a commitment in this chamber now for the best part of four years. Um, so I, I would like to ask councillors to consider and recognise the significant amount of work that has gone into getting these numbers to this stage, but also to recognise that at every stage in this process, as is clearly outlined in the report on pages 186 and 187, we'll be looking at the numbers, crunching the nurse numbers as hard as we can, because the last thing we want to be doing is spending money on things we don't need to, um, but we do need to get an outcome here, and uh, this has gone on too long, and we need to recognise the value of the work that's gone into this uh, significant report um, to get us to that next stage. Councillor Newton. Thank you, Melissef. So I just wanted to emphasise that this project has been on the way for a long time. I know that they've had a number of different locations that they've looked at. I know that we were looking at an elite facility before and that this is certainly something that's been on our agenda for the year and a half that we've been on council and far before, as Council McCarthy was saying. And I just really want to commend our officers for getting us to this point where rather than looking at an elite facility, we're looking at something for the community that's going to have huge benefit for women playing netball and other sports. Um, and that I believe that this point two around the $33 million cost, that is really reduced from when we were looking at an elite facility. And I think that this is the best that we can hope for. And I'm just really, really looking forward to getting it started. Thank you. Are there any further speakers to the amendment? Councillor me. I thought I'd say a few words because we haven't um, had a councillor from Kazali Ward comment on this yet. We've heard from the north and south. And um, while this facility is one that's in Rucker Ward, it is within the north of Rucker Ward and there aren't any facilities like this um, in Kazali Ward. So I have no doubt that there will be many um, women and girls in particular from Reservoir, from Preston, um, particularly in the east, which is somewhere where um, it's well recognised we need investment, um, will be able to access... Um, this facility, uh, and also freeing up uh, the spaces in Reservoir, as uh, Councillor McCarthy said, to be able to be used by local people, people who live in Reservoir and in Bandura. Um, in regards to the amendment itself, um, I would guess that there has been no single issue of such specificity that this council has been briefed on more thoroughly in the last 18 months um, than the Women's Multisports Stadium. It was something that was raised on our very first um, day, our very first briefing um, by council. Um, it sounds like from the issues raised by um, Councillor Lawrence that there were errors and oversights made by previous councils. Most of us weren't there, so I don't think it's really fair for us to be held accountable by um, your previous <laughs> councils, I suppose. Um, and the community has been waiting a really long time. Every delay um, brings more and more costs. One of the reasons um, that we learned that their uh, costings that we're seeing now are higher than some of the earlier estimates, one is that it was significant underestimate, second is some of the designs that were put forward just weren't realistic, and thirdly is that as land costs go up, as build costs go up, as um, requirements go up, it's going to be more expensive to... Um, build this in the future than to do it right now. Um, and finally, if we don't make the plans now to save the money now, then that's going to be more borrowings in the future and it's not fair to load that cost onto future residents. We need to Thank make you. some good financial decisions Thank now. Thank you, Councillor Mia. Are there any further speakers to the amendment? Is there a right, right No, of there's reply? no right of reply on the amendment. So we're talking to the amendment. So, yep, Councillor Messina. Sorry, I just had to clarify. I'm going to be opposing the amendment. Um, I was fortunate enough to um, open up the, so the synthetic soccer pitches the other week and uh, I took the time out to walk around the facility as it stands at the moment. And I visioned and I thought, what would the multi-sport stadium look like here? Will it fit in? Will the park? Will we have issues with the parking? And um, I'm not a rucker... Um, uh, I don't represent the rucker ward, I represent the Kazali walk. So I'll also say that I think that I can see numerous amount of um, residents attending that area. And um, I've, believe me, I asked lots of questions. And I asked, I think, about 50 questions over the time of, and asking significant questions about the funding and uh, allocation of um, what, where, how. And um, I think we've done significant research and I'm happy to um, recommend it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any... 
I think we've heard from everyone on the amendment, so we'll put the amendment to the vote. So that's um, point five. All those in favour and against? That amendment is lost. So we'll go back to the substantive motion, which is points one to four. Councillor Lawrence, do you uh, wish yes. to speak to the... speak in favour of the motion. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Um, Madam Mayor, yes, this, this situation um, is regrettable that a three-court indoor facility project in 18 months has tripled in, in price. That's an unfortunate circumstance and the arguments put forward today about cheap land when we're building on our own land um, embarrass me. Embarrass me as a citizen to hear some of the comments that were made around this table. I've been involved in other um, places lobbying for this and lobbying for the previous project, which was a $13 million project for three courts. So I'm not sure, and I've been in other places where the base cost is $3 million per indoor court plus extra things you add on. So I'm not sure why uh, in the eastern suburbs, the western suburbs, the northern suburbs and elsewhere they can plan these things and why this ends up like Yarra's, which is gold-plated. So I think we're going to have problems. I've certainly, from just a, 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 a... You know, I've got problems with that, how that costing's been done, and I remain to have problems with that when you're including things that should be in the master plan for John Kane, not in this project. But anyway... The needs for three to four courts indoor for netball and possibly for um, mixed um, basketball as well are documented. You can look at the Plenty Road um, timetable at the moment and two southern-based netball teams play there on a Saturday. So they can immediately relocate to a place like this. The rest of the Plenty Road is actually occupied by Whittlesea Basketball Association. So, obviously, four courts won't be immediately filled because two teams don't fill four courts. But over time, this four courts will be filled. And obviously, there's other opportunities given that we've got 500 uh, families in Darabin that are actually part of the Collingwood Basketball Association as well. So, there is a lot of... Uh, and obviously, there's a lot of Darabin people seconds. who are in Ivanhoe. So, this, this place will be filled. There's no doubt about it. But you need to do your bookkeeping better. You need to have competitive bids. We're bidding against Knox. We're bidding against Keylor, people who know how to build things. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Are there any further speakers? No? So I'll put that motion to the vote. All those in favour? Motion is carried. Item 8.3, funding agreements with neighbourhood houses and other community organisations. Councillor Rennie? Yeah. Hang on. Um, yes, thank you. I'd like to move that we um, an addition, um, which I said about earlier. Um, the addition relates... I'll just turn that on. This has gone to sleep. Um, so the proposed changes um, would be made to points three and four and they relate to the same changes that I discussed in 8.1 and there they are yep. up on the screen. So there's the motion up on the screen that was circulated by Councillor Rennie earlier this afternoon and that's seconded by Councillor McCarthy. Councillor Rennie, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, yes. I think it's fantastic that we've got to this point with our neighbourhood houses and also with diverse these organisations deliver so much for our community with a particular focus on vulnerable residents and those who are under stress and might otherwise be a bit left behind. These organisations have operated in, a, in a, a climate of some uncertainty in respect to their funding and their housing. Um, most of them operate out of buildings that council owns and we're proposing here to put in place longer-term funding agreements that will give them the certainty and enable them to, I think, go even further with their programming and with the offer that they have to our community. One of the things that I think is so amazing about neighbourhood houses is that they add so much value to what we do and I think they've demonstrated time and time again how they actually assist us with the delivery of our council plan. And I think that um, the bridge, which is the Preston and Thornbury neighbourhood house, is just a superb example of this with the Moon Rabbit Cafe that started up um, just down the road from here recently. 
It's a social enterprise. It offers employment experience, particularly to young people. But it's also been extraordinarily well received into the community, particularly in the context of some of the development that's occurred, and people saying, wow, what a fabulous asset to the community. And so here we have something that I think is really setting a new benchmark for how neighbourhood houses can operate and how they can add value. But it's not just about that neighbourhood house, and I'm sure many of you will actually speak to the value you see in other neighbourhood houses in your community. You know, I know the Alfington neighbourhood house just in the past year opened up a men's shed. Once again, a really fabulous opportunity. But in order to do that, they need certainty. In order to get the investment to build the men's shed, to put in the equipment and to put in the programming, they need to know that they're not just there for the next year or two, but they've got some certainty. And I'm also delighted that we've recognised this value that they contribute to our community by increasing their funding with an extra 10,000 to each house um, in the next financial year, um, thanks to everyone who voted for the budget, and with an extra 20,000 a year from the following financial year. I think this is a much more solid and sound financial model for our neighbourhood houses. In the past, they've applied for community grants, which they'll no longer be eligible for. That also increases the pool of money that's available in community grants for other organisations. One of the things about this new funding is it's really going to be pegged to their delivery of um, outcomes against our council plan. And I think it'll be amazing to watch what they can deliver and how efficiently and effectively they actually um, assist us in achieving what we want to achieve. So, um, you know, I, I think our partnership with Neighbourhood Houses is strong and I think this will strengthen it further. Thank you, Councillor Rennie. Councillor McCarthy. Uh, thank you. I second everything that Councillor Rennie has said. Um, I'm over the moon that this has finally come to us in this form. Um, having before I was on council, having served on the board of, uh, of Span House and having continued to be involved in our neighbourhood houses. Um, and for, for any resident or member of, of council who hasn't had that experience, I would say that the what's very interesting about our houses, and there are seven organisations, which includes Diverse, um, we have in the city of Darabin, we are incredibly lucky to have these organisations because they are place-based agitators of positive change and enablement and empowerment and transformation. And I just want to pick up on one of the one of the houses um, that does work that goes well beyond what a neighbourhood house was traditionally set up to do, um, which of course is PRACE. Um, PRACE delivers types of educational um, pathway programs and training programs for young people who have had experience in the juvenile justice system, have uh, are maybe homeless, maybe experiencing significant barriers to participation in mainstream employment pathways. And PRACE actually creates an open door policy for those young people to engage in VCAL, in a range of other programs, um, where no one else will say yes to them. They say yes, and they let them in, they support them, they back them 100%, and they not only give them the training and skills that they need to participate, but they also connect them with, with employers. And, uh, and that is not what a neighbourhood house was set up to do. Um, but that's what the price does. And in fact, one of the wonderful things to hear about recently um, meeting with the houses was to hear that when one of our other houses has a, a client or a, or a member of the community they need to work with and they don't offer that program, they're on the phone straight away to the house that does do that and they work with each other to make sure that's possible. That network, that web that we have of social infrastructure is significant. Every dollar we spend sees a $6 return into the community and, uh, and having an eight-year commitment to our houses means that the staff, the, the boards can make the sorts of commitments, including employment agreements with staff, um, that they deserve, long-term loyalty. Thank you, Councillor McCarthy. Are there any further speakers to this motion? Councillor Greco. Look, I'd like to support this, um, 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 the report and, and the motion, and, and also in particular, the, um, the inclusion of point three in regards to um, um, the, the funding, the extra funding that we're going to be providing to the uh, neighbourhood houses in the, in the next financial year. There was a bit of a concern by some of the neighbourhood houses that they only would start to receive the additional funding or the, or the funding as we've programmed it into the future starting in 2019, and I think that the adjustment there um, addresses that issue. Um, look, Oh, since I've been on council, I've found that neighbourhood houses are the ones that actually uh, deliver the goods um, in terms of um, engaging communities uh, and working effectively with um, a cross-section of the community. Uh, I've been actively involved with the reservoir, um, the newly established reservoir um, neighbourhood house that was established um, only, I think, as 
far back as maybe eight eight years ago, and um, and look where it's grown, and in terms of um, its activities, and when you go into a centre like that, you actually see the buzz um, of the um, um, of the participants and the workers that are there that actually put in not 100%, but 120% in terms of how they, they're engaged and how they actually uh, believe in what, they do, in what they're doing in terms of um, supporting the community. Because neighbourhood houses also support um, community members who um, are doing it tough and, um, and they're usually their first port of call in terms of re-engaging with the community or, or, or is, um, is, is through neighbourhood houses. As Councillor McCarthy mentioned, we're putting this money there, but... Think of it, multiply by that by six or seven, because that's the value and the output that we'll be getting um, from these community houses. So I commend the report. I commend the arrangement that we're entering into, and it provides a lot more security and stability for the neighbourhood houses. Thank you, Councillor Greco. Councillor Messina. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I just wanted to comment. Last Thursday, we attended the Northern Business Achievement Awards, and. Um, we sat in that breakfast and a few of us were there and we, one of the recipients of that award was Jack Lombard who works at, Lombardo, sorry, who works at the um, Moon Rabbit Cafe. And to hear him talk about his position and the um, work that he does with um, just the process of making coffee and changing somebody's life was enough for me. Um, I can't commend... Um, the recommendation and just listening to the passion and the involvement that he has with the um, students through the learnings at the Moon Rabbit Cafe. So I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Messina. Are there any further speakers? I'll put that motion to the vote. All those in favour? Motion is carried. Moving now to item 8.4, potential for affordable housing on council owned land. Councillor Lawrence. Ma Madam Mayor, just... Um a request, can we have that note as unanimously supported? Or? Uh, yes, so if we could note that 8.3 was unanimous. Thank you. 8.4, potential for affordable housing on council owned land. Councillor Messina, you'd like to move that? Yes. That's uh, seconded by Councillor Emil. Yes. Councillor Messina. Thank you. Um, this is about a significant amount of land at 52 to 60 Town Hall Avenue, Preston. Often there is confusion regarding the term social, affordable and uh, public housing. As a rule of thumb, public housing is usually considered affordable if it's, sorry, usually considered affordable if it's, uh, cost, let me start that again. As a rule of thumb, housing is usually considered affordable if it is cost less than 30% of gross household income. We, are, we often talk about assisting the vulnerable in our community. We've discussed that the vulnerable in our budget and we've often been heard, you don't do enough. Well, this is a, rec a recognition, a recognition of that demographic, a recognition of that need. As highlighted in the City of Darabin annual report, Darabin's unemployment is 6.3%. It's higher than the Melbourne greater average figure and higher than the Victorian figure. It's also highlighted in the council report plan that 38% of individuals have a personal income of $500 or less. What, we, what this motion will do is commence the expression of interest processing the identity of suitable tenant for the site, continue to advocate to the state government to increase the number of public and social housing dwellings in Durban, authorise the chief executive officer or delegate on council's behalf to negotiate and finalise and enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. So I'm happy to support the recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Amir, Councillor... Oh, Councillor Messina. Councillor Amir. Uh, so this is a um, proposal uh, uh, which is... I suppose one example of um, what council can be doing in terms of affordable housing. Um, so this particular um, example is around council-owned land, uh, 52 to 60 Town Hall Avenue, which is the uh, car park just behind the library, um, talking about going into an MOU arrangement with the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, where uh, hopefully for them to contribute $1 million towards an affordable housing project. This is a great project for so many reasons. It's a really good location, um, right in the centre of Preston, near a lot of shops, um, community services, public transport. 
Um, it's also exciting because um, it's not just about what might be achieved at this site, but it's about demonstrating um, one of the many ways that council can have an impact on housing. So we know that there's some really big levers that can be pulled by other levels of government around housing affordability, such as um, negative gearing, which please reform it. But given that that's outside our jurisdiction, it's exciting that there are small things that we can do. Um, and while this isn't... Um, uh, the impact might be only for a smaller number of people. It will hopefully be a springboard um, for other similar projects. In terms of what affordable housing means, it does mean different things to different people and that's something that um, once, hopefully, this will uh, be supported and we can really get into the nitty gritty of it. Um, something that made me laugh reading the report is it says, affordable housing does not produce a significant financial return. Now, now that we've got the budget over and done with, um, this makes me smile because it really reminds me that while, of course, we need to make really um, sound financial decisions, really the role of council is about making the community better for the community, for residents, for businesses. Housing affordability is one of the biggest issues facing um, all Australians, particularly those in capital cities, particularly ones in the inner city like people in Darabin. Um, so I'm really proud um, that we can make a small contribution to improving that. Thank you, that. Councillor Me. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Lawrence. Uh, just a question. Yes. What's your question? Um, this um, project, I just wanted to get some more information from officers. Um, previous councils had um, flagged this, I think, this project maybe four or five years ago. I don't know. A few terms ago. Um, so... So this project was flagged by the planning department uh, officers at the time, being next to um, the police station. But since then, we've had council motions identifying three much larger parcels of land for social housing. Um, and I was just wondering where that, that is at, because that's three years out too. I'll ask uh, Miss Olivia to... Uh, respond. So, uh, councillors, certainly there's been um, investigation work for a long time um, and that continues to be ongoing. At the moment, this is the, this is the side on the table that's sort of ticked the most boxes in terms of what we need in terms of um, location and, you know, we've done the feasibility checking for the site. So it's the one on the table for tonight, but it's certainly not the only investigation work that officers are doing. Councillor Lawrence. I would move a uh, amendment. Yes, Councillor Lawrence. Um, but uh, council officers report back on the other three projects, social housing projects, uh, as a matter of urgency. So we'll just get those words up on the... Oh, well, do the mover and second to accept that amendment? Urgency, just can I have some explanation what that means? Do you want some... Do you want the word... word do you want to hear those words again? Yes. Yep. Can we read out that amendment again? Um, if you'd like, we can replace the word urgency with uh, at the next council meeting. If we could read out the amendment again, though, please, Councillor Lawrence. Yeah. The officers report back on the three other social housing projects to the next council meeting. I have a question. Oh, sorry. Um, can I ask if the officers, if that's enough time, please? Um, it should be pretty straightforward. We could make that commitment. To accept it then. And the second up? OK, we'll incorporate that as a point six into the motion. Councillor Lawrence? Um, oh, I'm happy to moment. speak in favour of the motion. Just hang on one moment. Through you, Madam Mayor, I actually don't realistically think the early July council meeting is achievable. I think it's more likely to be the end of July, early August, in all honesty. So it won't be the next council meeting. It could be the council meeting after that. On that basis, I'm happy to accept the CEO's recommendation. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, report back. At the August, August Council meeting. At the August Council meeting. Mayor, Mayor, can I just get some clarity? I yes. thought I heard briefing in the first yeah. time, Councillor Lawrence. I'm happy to hear hear about the concerns or issues that Councillor Lawrence is concerned about at a briefing. But sorry, Councillor McCarthy, that you're debating the amendment now. Um, so the words are up on the screen that council officers report back on the three other social housing projects at the August council meeting. Was that your intent for it to come back to council or come council meeting or council briefing? Um, a, a council. Meeting. Yes, okay. Madam Mayor, I, I understand that a number of people around this table and around the outer table okay, so are at a disadvantage, but some of these things have already gone to tender. So, so Council, Council Lawrence, conclusion. we will ask the mover and seconder whether they're willing to. So, is that the amendment that you're proposing? Was my question. Are you happy with that yeah, amendment? Of August. Yes. Okay. We've been waiting three years, so happy with August. I'm happy with that. Okay, so that's been uh, accepted by the mover and seconder and will be incorporated into the substantive motion. So, Councillor Lawrence, you wanted to speak to the motion? Um, yes, Madam Mayor. I'm very happy to see this um, finally going. Um, this site was thrown up, as I said, in very early uh, policy work, going back a couple of elections maybe. Um, but I was more concerned about the previous commitment of the previous council, uh, which spoke to three larger sites and some much more substantive work and I had understood it had gone to tender and we were looking for housing trust partners to look at those developments of those sites and it went through a council process and I'll say it went through a very exhaustive council process and it's disappointing three years later I don't have an outcome. Did the tender not fall over, et cetera, et cetera? Because obviously the other three sites are much bigger than this site. This is a good little baby project to do. But again, I'd say this has been promised um, by um, council staff before. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Newton. Thank you, Melissa. I just want to say I fully support this proposal. I think that affordable housing in Darabin is very much needed. We have the potential seller for public housing land at Walker Street. We pushed for affordable housing in the Preston market development, which we unfortunately didn't get. So I think being able to deliver affordable housing quite close to Preston Market, I think, is really, really important. I'm also really excited that um, with this particular recommendation that we're going for, we're looking at leasing the site um, and doing something quite new. So I'm quite interested in the innovative aspects of that. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing this go ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Any further speakers? Count oh, no? I'll put oh, Councillor Greco. May I just quickly say that uh, I'm glad that this report has come to us. As, as I think has been mentioned by other councillors, it's a long time coming. Um, I think we would discuss this as far back as 2013, 2014, when the idea emerged about identifying a possible um, airspace or land, council land, that we, then we as a council could make a contribution um, to um, ensuring that we um, can provide some social housing within our city. I think it's important that we do this because, as we all know, both the federal government and the state government have retreated from this space and they're using all sorts of... Um, clever um, models that have, I think have been devised by bean counters and accountants um, in terms of trying to make it sort of cost neutral in relation to providing uh, fu future affordable housing. The, the other point that needs to be made, I think, um, um, councillors, is that uh, the, the notion of affordable housing is a very elastic notion. Um, you hear some developers even talking about affordable housing. So as we track this um, this process through, we have to be really, really uh, careful in terms of um, like where our intention starts and then where we end up in terms of a final proposal because um, I'm fully supportive of this proposal, but only if it delivers for um, 
uh, or it's skewed more towards uh, the most vulnerable um, people in our community in terms of getting, get, enabling them to have access to, um, um, to community housing and social housing. So we have to keep that in mind. And the final point I would make is that why is this important for council? I think it's important for council because we need to maintain as best as we can, notwithstanding the market forces that are at play in relation to the whole housing and development market, but maintaining the mix in our community because it's that mix that actually creates Darabin and makes Darabin a fairly special place and it's that mix that is changing um, very rapidly over time. Thank you, Councillor Greco. Are there any further speakers? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried unanimously. Moving now to item 8.5, Solidarity Statement for World Refugee Day, 20 June 2018. To, Let's move to by move Councillor Greco, seconded yeah. by Councillor Rennie. Councillor Greco. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Look, um, I, I'm glad that this is coming as a report because originally I had put a, a notice of motion to, um, um, to ensure that we um, did something around the, um, uh, uh, the um, refugee uh, day on the, 20, on the 20th of June. So um, it's quite um, self-explanatory here and um, it's a... It, it, it's an initiative where the Darabin Council already has a legacy, as we've often said in this chamber, of working with ref refugees and asylum seekers. And what, what has been proposed here is working together with the Refugee Council in terms of organising a, 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 um, a concerted effort across um, um, councils that are, have signed up to be um, uh, refugee welcome zones in relation to making sure that we can put our... Uh, our put forward our loudest voice in relation to um, advocating for, for the needs of refugees. It's an issue that is still there um, and it's an issue that won't go away unless there's uh, um, um, some change, in, obviously, in the federal government. And I also note that there are um, different voices, particularly in the opposition. I mean, I know the Greens have a very um, progressive um, approach and um, policy in relation to refugees. Uh, but I think it's something that we need to maintain the, the rage, if you like, around this particular issue because Australia um, is seen, sadly enough, um, I was just listening to the news the other day, um, um, in Italy there's, uh, they've got a conservative government, a uh, fairly um, conservative government that got in on the basis of um, an anti-refugee um, strategy. And they look to Australia as a model in terms of how we keep out refugees and things like that. That's a sad state of affairs that we actually use as a model um, in terms of um, keeping refugees out. So initiatives like this are key and very important in order to keep the, the issue on the radar um, with our community and particularly for the refugees and asylum seekers that have been inhumanely affected by our government's policies. Thank you. Councillor Rennie? I think that this issue highlights the role of cities. When federal governments fail so miserably, as indeed our government has, to demonstrate and show support for refugees, then it is even more important for cities such as Darabin to step up to the mark. In many ways, I think so many of us are actually quite ashamed with what's going on in this country at the moment, with the inhumane, hostile and aggressive way in which refugees and asylum seekers have been demonised. I think it brings shame on all of us, on, on us as a nation. And so what we can do here in Darabin <coughs> may not be an enormous amount in terms of actually changing those laws at a federal level, but I think it puts a little bit of humanity back into the issue and highlights the fact that there are people in this community who understand that refugees and asylum seekers are just people like you and me seeking a safe future for themselves and their families. Thank you, Councillor Rennie. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Newton. Thank you, Melissef. Um, just to follow on from Councillor Rennie's point, um, I spent a year with the United Nations in Uganda working with UN Women and spent some time in northern Uganda with South Sudanese refugees who had had to flee to northern Uganda. And the strength and resilience that those women sh showed in the face of losing everything, losing their homes, being part of a war, 
and the way that they struggled on, the way that they just wanted to build a new life, they wanted to learn how to farm, they wanted to start businesses, was incredibly inspiring. And I think that we should be a nation that looks to refugees for their strength and resilience rather than demonising and dehumanising them. So I'm very proud to support this and to do all that we can in Star to support refugees. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any further speakers? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? That motion is carried unanimously. Item 8.6, Darabin Nature Trust appointment of members. Councillor Amir. Uh, I'm happy to move the recommendation as written um, with the following names. Um, so to appoint Dr Jeff Westcott, Dr Chris Williams, Megan Ivy Law, Neil Masters, Dr Nadine Richings, David Taylor, Ray Radford, Heloise Gibb, and Matthew Rose. Uh, and I'd also um, like to add point three, if that's possible. Yes, you're moving the um, motion. Yep. Uh, that uh, applicant Helen Clark be included as a reserve member in the instance that the above members are unable to accept the role. Okay, so that's moved by Councillor Mir and seconded by Councillor McCarthy. Councillor Amir. So the Darabin Nature Trust uh, is an idea that um, we discussed probably over a year ago now. The intent is around protecting and increasing um, Darabin's green space. So that includes bushland, parkland um, and spaces to move and run and play. Um, it's very much linked in with protecting biodiversity as well as making sure that um, the residents of Darabin have the space um, that they need. The idea is around the creation of the um, Darabin Trust Interim Advisory Board, which we're appointing tonight, um, is that these people will work for the next 12 months um, in bedding down some of the detail um, of what, how this is actually um, going to happen, which can, we can then transition into the medium or longer term, uh, the Ad Nature Trust being a more independent um, board or even then an independent organisation that can attract volunteers uh, and funding in a way that's not possible for a level of government um, like council. So we had, um, sorry, just looking at the list, we we had um, 15 applicants um, for the Nature Trust, which is really great to see um, this level of interest from the community. There was a really um, good mix of people and a really high level of expertise um, that of the applicants that applied. What we were looking for, so there was a um, subcommittee of councillors together with some uh, council officers who uh, discuss, who read and discussed the applicants. Um, and what we were looking for is not just the highest level of expertise, but also making sure that we had uh, a mix of experience and skill sets. So particularly around people who understand biodiversity, ecology, um, how to protect our native flora and fauna, people with expertise in land management, people with expertise in mobilising the community, recruiting volunteers, keeping people motivated um, to help to protect the land, um, and also people who had experience in asset management and financial management. So together, these nine people, um, I believe, I think others will as well, um, have that expertise that we need to keep the Darabin Nature Trust in good hands to develop something really solid um, that will put us in a really good position to then um, transition to the independent model that will protect and increase um, Darabin's green spaces for hopefully many decades to come. Thank you, Councillor Amir. Councillor McCarthy. Councillor Lawrence. Just a question, Just a question Madam Mayor, through you. Um, do we have the 15 names of the applicants? in the report that who uh, There was a confidential uh, attachment that was um, circulated to councillors. Yep, in that, that one. So they should be in there. there um, Cathy's got one for you there. Okay. Councillor McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, 
Look, I'm really pleased that we are at this finally at this stage. Uh, this was one of the first items, in, in fact, that this council dealt with on December the sixth, our first meeting uh, of the new council in our first in, in our new term in 2016, um, was to uh, commit to setting up a Darabin Nature Trust. This is not a structure that um, exists in other local governments, as far as we know, in Victoria. Um, there have been similar things tried in other states. Um, significantly, it is a commitment to do what we do really well here in Darabin, which is get the right people in the room who know what they're talking about and who have a long-term commitment to delivering in a certain area. We've seen that through the Creek Committees, um, who have a long history um, and obviously are supported not just by Darabin but by other organisations. We've seen it with the Melbourne Innovation Centre, formerly the Darabin Enterprise Centre. We've seen it in terms of our various partnerships over the years with groups like the Darabin Ethnic Communities Council, um, obviously our neighbourhood houses, whom we mentioned before, um, and of course the extraordinary um, growth uh, that, that has occurred through the Inner North Community Foundation, supported of course um, by our investment over a long time um, in terms of the work skills and training um, programs that have been delivered um, through uh, what's now called Interwork. Um, so when we make a commitment, we want to get it right. And uh, when it comes to the Darabin Nature Trust, we have been overwhelmed with incredibly capable, skilled and knowledgeable people um, who want to play a role in this process, who want to act as custodians of the green open spaces that we currently have, the biodiversity we currently have, but also protect it and further it into the future. With a significant increase in population over the next two decades, we will see an increasing pressure and need for a green open space. So many children growing up and without seconds. backyards, um, biodiversity under threat through to development, these people will be guardians and custodians, or in fact, these the, the succeed them, in fact. Um, and the funding mechanisms, of course, are, uh, are something that we are now in a great position to be able to Thank secure you, as Council well. Thank you, are there any further speakers? Councillor Lawrence. Um, Madam Mayor, just for you, a question through to the um, selection committee, is it? Selection committee. Was there any criteria placed on the selection of these panel members to represent all three wards on this panel? Sorry, we'll deal with this question first. The answer that, actually. You, you went on the selection committee, so... <laughs> uh, I can provide an answer, because I was there. <laughs> um, so the selection committee looked at the selection criteria that was put out when we um, called for submissions, which is a part of Appendix C. There's a list there of the different... Um, selection criteria, and those are mainly based around um, professional expertise. But in the selection process, we did look at different types of diversity that we could reflect in the committee, and they include gender as well as the distribution in terms of wards. But yeah, I will note, and it is in the report, that there was a large proportion of people from the North Thornbury area who who submitted or made applications to be a part of the trust. So just a supplementary question. My glancing of this is there's two, two uh, members suggested here who live in the tribe ward. Is that correct? There's only two? Um, I believe that is correct. Let, I can go through and have a look at the addresses. I guess the difference between this type of um, appointment and a community reference group or an advisory committee is more about the skills that we are also searching for. So yes, we want it to be representative of the community, but we also want it to be um, people to bring their professional expertise to, to this trust. Yep. So I think that you're correct that if we look through, there are two people from the Lord Trobe Board. Are there any further speakers? I just got a question, um, Mayor. I, I've just noticed, without making names of the, uh, I, I just noticed that one of the um, people on the list there um, will not be available um, for the first uh, two meetings. And I understand there'll be three meetings in all. And so I'm just wondering how that would actually effectively work. 
if, uh, if somebody's absent for two of the three meetings. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. Hang on. Pardon? Those, those meeting dates are actually not going to be the meeting dates. Um, so we would need to go back out and ask everybody. This, um, obviously, two of those dates have passed and the next one is in a couple of weeks. So we'd need to reset a whole, the dates for all of the meetings. So the meeting dates that we put out to, to the applicants when they express their interest are no longer the meeting dates of the trust. Yep. Any other speakers for the motion? Councillor Lawrence. Um, yes, Madam Mayor, I'd like to speak in favour of the motion. Um, as has been noted by Councillor McCarthy, this is a new um, innovation and um, I think it's one that is worth supporting and I have supported it uh, for two years. The reason being, I think, <laughs> um, the model of democracy where you just have a rubber stamp every four years is kind of broken, especially when we're sitting around waiting five years, six years for affordable housing to come on stream. So I think that this model of engaging community and the expertise that is within the community, and I'd note without signalling out any people, um, the two people from La Trobe Ward that will be on this are actually very well qualified people. Um, so, uh, so it is an important step because the open space has not been recognised by the local government office as a primary responsibility of local government. And we still have that um, pressure from the local government agency that open space isn't important. I can tell you open space is always important. Open space is very important in the Trobe Ward because in the future none of us can afford to have a full block in the Trobe Ward because the whole of the Trobe Ward is a development site now. So the public open space and the preservation of it is going to be vital. Um, this body means that um, uh, open space doesn't become a political football. It means that we'll have a community basis about the development of open space. And um, I hope um, we actually contribute more to uh, preserving and enhancing our open space in the future. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Are there any further speakers? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? That motion is carried unanimously. Item 8.7, proposed road discontinuance adjoining 1 Brockton Avenue Reservoir. There's the recommendation in front of us. Was that moved by Councillor Rennie? Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Messina. Councillor Rennie. Um, yes, thank you. This is a statutory process which um, occurs from time to time when we have effectively laneways that are surplus to our needs and where there is a community desire to... Um, uh, own those laneways. Um, quite often it occurs when people actually have already effectively been in possession of a laneway. So um, there are a number of rigorous steps that council goes through to ensure that um, there are no other claims on the land, that the community is aware of what we are doing, and um, that's what this does tonight. It commences those statutory processes so that um, we can ensure that um, we don't hold on to the land and that the person who wants to own or people who would like to own the land can do so, but that it's all transparent. Thank you. Councillor Messina. Nothing further. Thank you. Are there any further speakers? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? That motion is carried. Item 8, uh, 9, consideration of responses to petitions, notices of motion to general business. There is none. Item 10. Notices of motion, 10.1, Strathallan Golf Club land value. Councillor Greco. I'll move that. Um, Thank yeah. you. That second, I think Councillor Newton had her hand up. Sorry, Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Newton. Standing. Pardon? Standing. <laughs> Happy to review the video later. <laughs> um. <laughs> okay. Um, do you want to read out that amendment? Yes, I do. Do. Uh, just a second. Uh, just a point of order yep. for clarity. Mm. Yep. I'm just trying to understand. Is Sorry. Councillor Newton seconding the motion? She's seconding the motion with a change. She's proposing a change and she will second it. 
Okay. So, yes, to clarify... You're, you're correct. Just Thank trying to keep you. up. Sorry, Councillor Lawrence. Hang on just a second. Yep. Oh, okay. That's fine. So, what do I need to do? So, you don't second the motion. Okay, I withdraw <laughs> seconding the motion. Is that what we do? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so the motion, the motion was moved by Councillor Greco. Is there a seconder? Is there a seconder? I'm Count happy to second the motion <laughs> so we can move forward. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Greco. Uh, after that, I'm happy to speak to <laughs> it. Uh, look, Councillors, I, um, this is a motion that I'm putting forward in terms of helping to progress the, um, the Strathalen um, Golf um, Club land um, um, uh, dispute, if you like, with um, the La Trobe University. Um, um, we heard earlier from um, um, the um, president of the of the um, of the Australian Golf Club, pointing out to us uh, some issues in relation to the valuation that the um, that the Victorian uh, that the valuer general of Victoria has uh, has come up with, and how that valuation is. Um, is considered to be a bit unrealistic in, in the sense that um, given that the land is being used as a public open space and given, as we heard earlier from um, our officers, that there's no move um, uh, to change the zoning of the land on the part of the council so th and um, that the valuation that um, has been put forward by the Valuer General, in a sense, is a bit unrealistic and also it doesn't assist in terms of uh, future negotiations in regards to um, how this land could stay in, um, in, in, in public hands, uh, particularly um, putting the council in a position where it could actually negotiate in good faith with La Trobe University in, in holding on to that land and ensuring that it remains public open space. We also heard some good news that La Trobe University has offered a five-year um, lease. I understand that that offer has been made. The technicalities of that have to be worked out and the fine print of that has to be um, um, looked at. Uh, but I think that's a good move. And, and I think that's been in part, one, obviously, by the, the amount of work and mobilisation of the, um, the people that have been concerned with the with, with the open space and, and, and some of the attitudes that the Tribe University has taken, and also the fact that the council has been fully supportive or backing up, if you like, the community resistance that um, um, against La Trobe University um, sort of um, steamrolling ahead with, uh, with this public land. We know the history. I don't want to go through it now, but essentially uh, it was public land that was given to La Trobe University at a very, very reduced price. And now La Trobe University is looking at... Um, 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 because of their expansion plans and their master plans of um, utilising that land for other purposes. So it, in the few minutes, a few seconds that I've got left, so the, the crux of this um, resolution is basically is to ask the Victoria, uh, the Valuer General of Victoria to seek a second valuation so we can get a more realistic valuation and also to, to ensure that the that the valuation report, as prepared by the Valuer General, is made public. Given that we're talking about a public asset and public land, it's only... Uh, follows that the um, that the that information is made public, and the third point there is that um, any correspondence that we send to the Victoria uh, to the Valuer General is also sent off to um, Colin Brooks and other members of Parliament Thank who you. I know that have been carefully following um, this matter. Thank you, Councillor Greco. Councillor Lawrence. Um, are we waiting for an amendment? Can I reserve my speaking yes, you can reserve. we get to the amendment? Yes. Councillor Newton. Can I please propose an amendment? Yes, you can. Would you like to read it out? Thank you. Yes, I would, Melissa. <laughs> the amendment, if we can bring it up on screen, is request that officers investigate the detailed terms associated with the contract of sale for the acquisition of the Strathallan Golf Course land by La Trobe University from the state government, including any actual or implied requirements for use, retention, covenants, all legal restrictions and further, and researches the detail of any communication used to announce the sale. There's a mover and secondary oh, acceptance. I'm happy to support that addition. Thank you. And the second. I'm up? happy to include that. Okay, so we'll incorporate that into the substantive motion. Would anyone like to speak to the motion? Councillor Lawrence. Um, yes, Madam Mayor. Um, 
I'd like to speak in favour of the motion and uh, um, thank Councillor Newton for addition to that motion for us to get more information. It's really vital that the citizens of Darabin are given more information about this and um, obviously the users are even wider than the city of Darabin of this area. Um, because we're talking about ratepayers potentially and we're talking about the university, all publicly funded entities doing a land swap or doing something with land. And it should all be out in the open. Um, we do know from when this subdivision was created, this wildlife corridor, uh, which has served as also partly as a, as, as a recreation club as well, as a golf club as well, uh, was actually purchased by the university for only the value at that time of two or three empty blocks. And you can imagine how big that whole subdivision was. It was a, a leading subdivision with Springthorpe nearby and then also other subdivisions, related subdivisions um, in Creswell Grange itself. So um, it was obviously given away because it was envisaged, it would act as open space for that community, that growing community, uh, forever. Now, we have sort of this faith in, in institutions and it seems strange that they're evoking commercial incompetence when they were actually given a gift and it's time to give it back and to come to uh, maintain its initial pur purpose, which was a town planning, a carefully town planned purpose, which was uh, about being a, a critical habitat link and a critical piece of open space for that community. Ten so I congratulate all councillors on this council for being very resolute in trying to preserve this open space. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Newton. Thank you, Melissa. I just wanted to acknowledge um, Peter Roberts in the audience, um, Harvey, who spoke before, and John Berriman and Jeff Blackwood from the Save Strathallan Open Space Community Coalition um, that have really done an amazing job of advocating to keep this land as open space. Um, I wanted to acknowledge that there is a rally in support of the open space this Sunday, 11 a.m. at the Strathallan Golf Club, so do come along to that. Um, and I do think that this is really, really worth council looking into as closely as we can. Um, I know that uh, there has been some work done around this already, but I really want council to investigate the details about what happened around, I think it was 1994, um, and do as much as we can from our level. I also just really want to emphasise that we've had a lot of support from Colin Brooks, who's the local member for Bandura, um, and that there is pretty wide support from retaining this in an open space, and we just have to do everything we can to get to that point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Newton. Are there any further speakers? No, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? That motion is carried. Moving now to item 10.2, level crossings. Councillor Greco. Yeah, I move the, um, this particular motion. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Happy to second. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Greco, would you like to speak to this motion? Thank you, Mayor. And um, look, uh, this motion is a fairly simple motion, a fairly straightforward motion. Um, what it basically um, demands is that um, is that we um, is that we write to the level crossing authority because um, we need some clarification yeah, as to when the um, the works in regards to the Bow Street and Reservoir crossings actually will commence. And just to give a, a brief note in that um, when um, uh, when the Labor government was elected, the state Labor government, uh, as part of their first batch of 20 level crossings to be done in their first term, um, the reservoir level crossing and also the, um, the Bow Street level crossing were included in that first batch. Reservoir level crossing was included towards the end after a lot of community um, pressure and, um, and so it was supposed to have uh, been started and work was supposed to have been commenced. If you looked at the website, it actually showed that actually the contracts were supposed to have been already signed and also to the point where uh, works were, were expected to, to commence. It's a bit vague now. If you look at the site now, it talks about works to commence in 2018. There's a, another grace period there of a few months, but we haven't actually seen anything, anything taking place. Um, why it's important that we uh, need some clarification in relation to this, because we need the, the state government to be absolutely clear that it's committed that these um, level crosses will actually occur 
within its existing budget allocation because we don't want to get to a point where there's an election and when there's elections, there's all those uh, promises that are given, there could be a change in government and we may not get delivered something that was promised to us or to the community um, in regards to the Bell Street and to the reservoir crossing. So we need to get a clear undertaking from the, um, uh, from the um, level crossing authority that, that the works are included in the of part of the initial 20, or the batch of 20, and that there is some commitment that, that, the, that it will not be um, hindered or compromised by the election that will occur in November this year. The community has been waiting for this for a long time. We know we don't have to sort of repeat the history about the level crossings. They're two of the most um, dangerous level crossings in across the metropolitan area, particularly the reservoir level crossing. And it's not also, and we're not only talking about the level crossings, we're also talking about, particularly with the reservoir level crossing, we're also talking about fixing the junction. That is fixing the road network that actually circulates around the, the, around the level crossing. And also we've been proactive as a council in relation to the Bell Street level crossing in putting forward suggestions to, um, to see if we could do more level crossings because there would be an economy of scale, uh, uh, economy of scale in terms of um, um, reduced cost for the state government. So I urge councillors to support this so that we can get some definitive answers from the level crossing authority. Thank you, Councillor Greco. Councillor Lawrence. Um, yes, Madam Mayor, um, I'm happy to support this motion, uh, notice the motion from Councillor Greco. Um, it's been quite a long journey um, in terms of addressing this level crossing. Uh, however, I should note that the City of Darabin and the City of Moreland uh, actually facilitated policy debate about level crossings when we put four dangerous level crossings in our two cities together and did a costing with a Canadian construction and engineering company about how value capture could actually deliver all these crossings at half the price that previous Liberal and Labor governments had been paying for level crossing removals. So, um, so both Moreland and Darren were very keen and shared quite a bit of information with the opposition at that time which the Premier at that time wasn't too interested in. So, as has been noted, um, throughout that debate, I think there was a opposition major projects involved. There was Dick Wynne involved, who was filling in for transport at the time, and they uh, data mined us, really, and then developed a statewide project. So, my understanding, given at various levels at the time as mayor or as a councillor also advocating this, that this would be done in this first term. So I don't have any other information than that. It came from, at that time, the people who were responsible for these projects and uh, we should remind them. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Are there any further speakers? No? I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? That motion is carried. Moving now to 10.3, Preston Market Heritage Overlay. Councillor yes, Greco. Thank you, I'll move this um, particular item. It's moved by Councillor Greco. Second and seconded by Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Greco. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Look, the, uh, the motion, the way it's worded, I think it's quite self-explanatory. It gives some, some of the context and also um, um, and also seeking to move and resolve on, on in relation to certain matters. First of all, I think it needs to be said, councillors, that um, um, we all received um, a letter uh, from, um, I think, four or five uh, reference group members that are part of the, um, the VPA's um, reference group, um, expressing concerns about the, um, the, the process and expressing concerns about, if you like, the powers or the jurisdiction, if you like, of the, of the reference group. Um, I attended um, two of the reference group meetings and, and these concerns were, were raised right at the outset at the first meeting. And, uh, and the concerns were uh, basically that, um, that the reference group has essentially has a limited role and, that, um, and also that the reference group has introduced some unnecessary delays in developing a proposal to put forward 
to the minister in regards to a, a new um, incorporated plan to govern the, the planning controls over the, over the Preston Market um, site. And, um, and, those, um, and that delay will actually extend the, the, um, the, the development of the incorporated plan way beyond uh, after, to, after the election. So what this motion then proposes is that, um, is one, is that the council reconsider the heritage overlay. That's something that we can do that's within our control. And, uh, and I'm still bewildered, like many community members are, of why the council is not going down the path of seeking her a heritage overlay, given that we've had a report, a heritage report, that clearly says that. And also the, um, the peer review is, is also um, saying that 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 is an option that council should seriously consider. Also, um, what, what in the motion that I'm, I, I'm putting forward is that, that, that the council also seeks to undertake further research. The VPA is not going to do that research. The minister is not going to do that research. It's incumbent on the council for us to do that research, as it's been recommended to us from the um, heritage report and also the other documents that we've seen that have come forward in relation to the peer review or suggesting clearly suggesting that uh, we do some extra research and extra work in order to um, further um, our case in regards to um, heritage controls. And also what the motion here seeks is, is that um, given that the unnecessary time delays in regards to preparing a, um, a, a new integrated plan, because we were promised that the integrated plan will be done in July so that then it could be on the minister's desk by August and that the minister could actually make a decision on this side of the election. So what we have now instead is that uh, any proposal is going to go to the minister, um, um, slap up with the, uh, the caretaker period, so that the minister is essentially off the hook and that does not need to make a decision in relation to uh, the incorporated plan. That puts us uh, not in a very strong bargaining position in relation to getting some good, solid controls of, over the site. Thank you, Councillor Greco. That's time. Councillor Lawrence. Um, Madam Mayor, I'm happy to support this motion and again um, I need to kind of stress the importance of this heritage overlay in, as we move forward. Um, it's been frustrating to deal with this on council for the last three or four years where proposals have been put up that are in direct contravention with the vision to preserve the footprint in the structure plan of Preston, which was laid down by council, which I was not part of. Now, personally, I think that footprint is restrictive and I don't understand why we wouldn't have higher buildings in the centre of Preston. That's my view. That's not the view of this council or the previous councils. And one of the tools to loosen up those previous restrictions has always been this call for a review of the integrated plan. So don't be naive, community shouldn't be naive. The call for a review of the integrated plan will be to push more a box hill solution. That's the world we live in now. So the current plan takes us back 20 years in terms of densities. That's what they're trying to do. We have to face that's going to be a reality because whichever process you go through, you end up with independent panels or VPA pushing high densities. That's why we should be developing heritage controls that are driven locally and that have teeth and that cause planning permits to be requested because the processes of reviewing the integrated plan will water it down. And now's the time, and I'll say that to someone who thinks there should be higher heights on this site, now's the time to actually have the heritage control in the toolkit, and it should have been done. Thank you. Are there any further speakers, Councillor Amir? In talking about this issue, I thought I'll start with um, what we all agree on. And um, I, I hope, I think the nine councillors all agree um, that we want to retain Preston Market as a vibrant, affordable, multicultural, open-air fresh food market that has uh, the vibe that people love, something that is not like anywhere else in Melbourne. And I know for a lot of people who were born outside Australia, they say makes them feel like home and it's the only place um, in Melbourne that makes them feel like home. Uh, so that's um, one of the things that's underlying all my decisions about Preston Market. 
Um, so then I'm, to move on to some of the context. So um, as we know, Council's working currently with the community uh, and the VPA to develop a vision that has um, already been put forward by the community reference group and to make plans about the market. So we're, to use a probably overused phrase, in the tent, um, talking with the people um, who will be able to make the decisions by making the recommendations to the minister um, on what's happening to the market and uh, the best way to protect it. The other piece of context which is very heavily weighing on my mind is that after we um, all agreed to oppose the application by the owners of the market Salter to have those three towers uh, near the market site, that we then, um, they appealed, we went to VCAT and we put everything we could behind that VCAT fight. That was over $100,000 of ratepayers' money on lawyers, on staff time. That's time that then, oh, God damn, couldn't be spent um, on other really important work. And that's services um, and infrastructure that we couldn't deliver, over $100,000. To do this, the estimates are up to, or potentially even more, $180,000 of ratepayers' money. I just don't think it's worth it. Thank you, Councillor Amir. Are there further speakers? Councillor Messina. Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, it's important to understand that we all agree, as Stephanie, uh, Councillor Amir stated, Preston Market is the heartbeat of Darabin. Her cultural significance is important. That's not the debate. Cultural significant me significance means that a place has historical, social, spiritual value for past, present and future generations. Cultural significance is embodied in the place itself and its use. Now let's get to us some facts, not sensational media headlines or flying monkeys on social media. Fact, Preston Market is not owned by council, it is owned by, Salter, by Preston Market Development, who enters into commercial leases, lease agreements with business owners. Council does not enter into these law binding contracts. Council has no say in these lease agreements. Fact, a heritage overlay is used to protect the site that, have he that has heritage value, meaning that the individual buildings or whole urban precincts may be covered. The protection afforded by the protect heritage overlay is a control that applies to the built structures and not how the land is used. I repeat, not how the land is used. When I compare the iconic Preston Market to others listed on the Victorian Heritage Database, here's what I found. Jarabin. In Darabin, there are nine properties listed on the Victorian Heritage Database. They are examples of the Bandura Park Homestead, built in 1900. The former Mont Park Hospital, built in 1909. The former Northcote Theatre, built in 1911. The Preston Tramways Workshop, built in 1924. The Queen Victoria Market was also listed. It began development in 1859. What building on the Preston Market site requires the same protection as the properties on the register? When I look at the market, there's a mismatch of building carcasses that need refurbishment. I'm going to run out of time. Do I believe she's iconic queen and she has certificate? Oh, no. Don't tell me I've run out of time. Can I just make one more statement? One last sentence. Okay. What keeps the market alive? It's the pulse. It's the, it's, the, it's the consumers and the traders. It is not the heritage overlay that you're recommending. Thank you, Thank Councillor you. Messina. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Newton. Thank you, Melissa. I think a lot of really good stuff has been said already, but I just really want to get us to refocus on the outcome that we all want, which is retaining the Preston market as a fresh food, open air market. And the path to do that may not be a heritage overlay that council pursues. We know that from the officer's recommendation that the best way to pursue it is through the VPA process, who can look at a heritage overlay as one of their recommendations, and we are writing a letter to do that. So I'm, I've been really quite disappointed at the way that people are playing politics with this issue and claiming that there's some sort of agenda that's going on, and I don't think any councillor has an agenda where they want to see the market go. So I think we just need to get back to a place to agree that every councillor wants to see the market thrive into the future for the next years and decades and to get back on that focus rather than a wild goose chase of a heritage overlay. 
Thank you, Councillor Newton. Are there any further speakers? Councillor McCarthy. I think we need to be really frank here um, because I've heard a few things in the debate tonight and in previous um, discussions of this and references to the election time frame um, and the fact that we want to get as much pressure on the minister before the election to get an outcome. Let's be frank. The minister has put in place the VPA process to manage this process. Whether you like it or not, that's the process that's in place. We do not have control over that. The minister has made it very clear that he is looking for the VPA through the process to recommend integrated planning controls, which includes whether heritage protection should be part of that. If you step into the minister's shoes, and that is the audience that, who we are dealing with here, whether it's the current minister or a future planning minister, the minister is looking for recommendations from the VPA, of which council is currently a partner. Council may choose to not be a partner with the VPA if we disagree with their direction, but that's not what we're doing. We're working collaboratively to get the best outcome. We would be silly to not do that because they have the power and the influence right now to make recommendations to the minister. If I'm an advocate in any situation, I want to know who has the power to make a decision. And the fastest way to get to that power is via, in this case, the VPA process. Now, whilst it's inconvenient that, we, that the time frame that the minister and the VPA have supported goes beyond the state election, and I've heard a few people mention that this evening, that's the situation we're dealing with. So let's be frank. If we are serious about wanting to save the, the fresh food market at the Preston market, then we need to think about how to work tactically and strategically to actually get that outcome. The uh, heritage overlay will not be supported by the minister if it is not supported by the VPA. So we have put that recommendation to the, to the VPA to look at the evidence to consider it. Thanks. Now, that is the best pathway for us. That is the recommendation um, that office has brought to us and that is what this council has supported. And I think if we really are serious about saving Preston Market, we need to stop the politicking. Thank we need you. to get on with a strategic process. Thank you, Councillor McCarthy. Councillor Greco, would you like the right of... Oh, sorry, hang on. Any further speakers? Would you like the right of reply? Yeah, just very quickly, I just pick up on some of the points that we've made. Uh, we all say that we want to save the market. Um, I've heard that a million times. And, um, but I think what we're not doing, councillors, is, is, is that we're not taking the next step. And, and that the next step is, is actually to um, seek a heritage overlay. I agree and I understand that a heritage overlay does not uh, address the use of the market. But what a heritage overlay does, it actually protects the building of the, the market side and from demolition and protects it against um, and future development in the sense that the way it protects it is that the um, owners would need to make an application to council if they demolish, if they wanted to demolish or wanted to build on the site. So when we say that we want to protect the market, if we don't protect the actual building that's there on the site, then what are we protecting councillors? We can't protect then the social significance of the market. And I'm still astounded, councillors, that, um, that we have reports that tell us that we should apply for a heritage overlay and we're not doing that, notwithstanding the limitations of heritage overlay. If the heritage overlays were that weak, we would not have one heritage overlay uh, applicable to our city. We would just uh, not even bother with that. Here we have a market, the second biggest market in Victoria, and we're not doing that. The other thing too is about the VPA. The VPA is an extension of the minister, essentially. So, so when we say that the VPA is going to like a sort of an independent um, arbitrator or things like that, that's not the case, councillor. We've got to be actual factual about that. What a heritage application would actually enable us to do is that if we don't advocate for that, who's going to advocate for that? And when a heritage application is actually made, the minister usually calls uh, a heritage panel to independently assess and in relation to whether the, the market has heritage value. And the final Thanks. point that I make is about uh, the lack of evidence. We're not even, we're not even uh, producing the reports or the necessary research in order to present the evidence in relation to the market. If we don't do that, others are not going to do that. So I, I really urge councillors to really think hard about this, to not uh, look at this as a, as, sort of as a block vote, but to consider the merits of what we're actually Thank doing you, and not to, Greco, and not to sell decline. the market short. Councillor Messina? Um, I know we can't comment, but I have the right to ask two questions, do I not? Uh, we can ask questions before the vote is put. Can I put those questions to Councillor Greco? No, you cannot. Okay, then I withdraw my call.
<laughs> okay, we'll put the um, we'll put that to the vote. All those in favour and against, that motion is lost. Okay, moving on in the agenda, item eleven: reports of standing committees. There are no reports. Item 12, records of assemblies of councillors. 12.1, assemblies of councillors held. That was moved by Councillor McCarthy and seconded by Councillor Messina. All those in favour? Motion is carried. Item 13, reports by mayor and councillors. There should be a copy of your, the report in front of you that was circulated earlier. That's moved by Councillor Rennie, seconded by Councillor McCarthy. All those in favour? Motion is carried. Item 14, consideration of reports considered confidential. There are none. And that brings us now to the close of the meeting. Thank you very much for staying to the end <laughs> and for those who may be online as well and to staff. <laughs>